Edwards in London. Here are your top stories. Perilous predictions. The S&P drops nearly 18% on the year, but famed investor Jeremy Grantham says the super bubble he's been warning about is still yet to pop. Keeping up the pressure, yields rise as investors fully price in a 75 basis point ECB hike. The Fed's Loretta Mester says rates need to rise to above 4% by early next year. Plus, Chengdu lockdown. China puts 21 million under new COVID measures, the biggest city to shut since Shanghai earlier this year. Welcome to the programme, everybody. Just 15 seconds or so until the start of the European equity trading session. Let's have a look at the futures picture. And this is what we've got for you. Eurostox 50 futures, DAX futures and FTSE futures, all very much in the red, down by nine tenths of a percent, so nearly a percent on Eurostox 50 futures. So as we get today's session, Thursday's session underway, let's pull up the GMM screen and see uh, where these equity markets are opening. You can see them on the far side there in the FTSE 100, the first to jump into the fray. Uh, so fairly, fairly, I was going to say flat, but flats are negative on the FTSE 100. We are expecting then some moves lower on equity markets and a couple of our headline stories really having an impact here. The Fed conversation continues, of course. How quickly will those rates rise? How high will they get to? Loretta Mester, the latest Fed voice, to add her view, and she's talking about above 4% by the beginning of next year. We're also nervous, of course, about the growth outlook globally and getting a reminder of what's going on in China uh, with the latest headlines around Chengdu and a lockdown there. 20 million or so people put into lockdown there. So all of that taking the edge off the Asia session, and that is filtering through into Europe. The CAC 40, the Spanish IBEX, and the FTSE 100 all showing some negativity. Uh, and uh, that is how we start our European trading day. Let's move on to some other assets for you. We've got uh, a focus uh, across the globe, really, on uh, what's happening over in the United States. S&P futures also showing some weakness, so down by six tenths of one percent in terms of your U.S. equity outlook. The U.S. 10-year yield, 3.2 uh, percent. Interesting to keep an eye on what's happening here, given the ongoing Fed conversation. It, it continues to work its way into the markets. We're talking about possibility of a bear market for global bonds. That's still a very live conversation. And of course, the ECB side of things, so the European part of that bond market narrative, really interesting with big moves in, in Burns and also in the UK uh, bond markets yesterday. So a global theme with the sort of local expression. This is the uh, US dollar uh, in there as well for you. We are seeing some moves into the US dollar because of the risks around China and elsewhere. And the Brent uh, the Brent uh, crude price, 94.88. So it rallied a little bit on fears of what was going on in Iraq and in Libya, uh, but then retreated on reassurances from Iraq. But also, it is the end of August, or it was the end of August, beginning of September. Are we fully in our stride? How much do we read into this negativity in oil? Let us get over to our Markets Live Managing Editor, Mark Cuffmore, who joins us uh, with a look at what is on his mind today. And I know thinking about the Fed conversation, that is something that's front and center for you then, Mark. Yes, Anna, I am also struggling with that change of month, that change of the calendar, but it is a reminder that this month we will get the next FOMC meeting, we will get the next dot plot. So one of the themes of the last few months has been this idea of the Fed fighting the market. Well, the market has capitulated, the Fed has won this round, and generally the pricing is much more aligned between where the market is pricing and where the Fed is pricing. However, later this month we're going to get another dot plot, and I expect that to shift the pricing up again and we'll have that battle again. So what will happen? So the green line here is where the media median dots were at the June meeting. The red line is where rates are priced in the market based on OIS pricing. So you can see that at the moment, for end of 22, the market is now pricing in higher than where the dots were in June. And that makes sense. We've had a sequence of hawkish messages and a whole bunch of data since then. So I expect that in the September dot plot, the green line, i.e. the Fed dots, will move up to roughly match this. There is some two-way risk but I don't think there's, that's where there's kind of real value. What's going to happen farther out the curve, though, is that the 2023 dots will probably 
probably also be shifted higher because you'll still get some outliers in the top side. You'll remove some of the downside outliers. All those dovish people are all gone. They've all changed their tone. Neil Kashkari, of course, the epitome of this idea of changing from an extreme dove to a hawk. So I expect this part of the curve to shift up. And then we're going to have that battle again with the market. And I think the market will again lose that battle. And again, at the long end, I think we'll see the curve, the dots shift up, and that will put pressure on the market. So I think we're ready. The first round has been won by the Fed. I think that later this month, we're going to get set up for another round. My view, of course, is that the Fed will win again, and the market will have to capitulate to higher yields. OK, Mark, with his don't, don't fight the Fed message, uh, our Bloomberg Markets Live managing editor, Mark Cudmore, with the latest on Fed thinking. Let us get to one of our other top stories. We mentioned it in our headlines, and it has certainly had an impact on the Asia session. China will conduct its biggest COVID lockdown since Shanghai, starting from 6 p.m. local time today, and the measures will be in place indefinitely. Chengdu's 21 million residents will need a negative test to leave the city, and families will be allowed to send only one person out once per day for groceries. These, these are the kind of policies that seem like a distant memory for many people around the world, but not so if you're in Chengdu. Uh, let us get the broad story through then from China, and we'll go to Beijing for that. We're joined by Bloomberg's John Liu. Uh, John, really good to have your, your perspective on this. What do we know about the lockdown plan so far then? Uh, just what you said, Anna. Uh, I think most importantly, it's the indefinite nature of the timeline. Uh, we do not know yet how long this lockdown is going to last. Uh, Chengdu, the city, uh, it's important in terms of a manufacturing base for automobiles. We have companies like uh, VW, Toyota, they have operations there. Uh, there are electronics made there, Foxconn, the assembler for uh, Apple and other uh, makers of electronics. Uh, Intel has some operations there as well. I think this could go to uh, one of two ways. This could either turn into a grinding lockdown that lasts for two months like we saw in Shanghai, or it could last for a few days, and with infections coming down, it could end. And so I think the markets have not reacted so strongly as maybe we would have thought because there is that possibility that after a few days, this could end. And so that indefinite nature, I think, is what people are focused on at the moment. Okay, you could, yeah, as you say, you could read that either way. John, thanks very much. Thanks for the update, Bloomberg's John Liu in Beijing, giving us important context about the role of that region within the Chinese economy. Joining us now for more is Emmanuel Cao, Head of European Equity Strategy at Barclays, and Christine Aquino joins us from our Markets Live team as well. Emmanuel, let me come to you first. Clearly, this is just the latest line out of China that makes us concerned around Chinese growth. Um, do you, uh, th this is something that uh, then sometimes weighs on luxury stocks and anything that's uh, very reliant on China. Uh, have we sort of priced all of that story in, though, do you think, Emmanuel? I mean, I feel like we've been here a number of times. We've been there many times, actually, and I don't think the news flow should come as a surprise to the market because, you know, China made very clear that fighting COVID is their number one priority. And to some extent, the summer rally uh, felt misplaced to us, you know, on the view that the Fed will make a dovish pivot, that China troubles were basically behind us. And I think what we are seeing is simply the market coming back to a dire reality where the growth policy mix is, is not that great. You don't have this Fed pivot. You don't have any support from central banks. And China, which used to act as a counter cyclical balance, usually for the global economy, is not able to do that now because they need to fix COVID. And for now, the only way they can do that is by locking down some cities when cases are picking up again. Mm, yeah, a, a timely reminder then, Christine, of the risks associated with Chinese growth at this point. And not a surprise that when you get these headlines, you do see a bit of weakness on the likes of European luxury goods. Uh, we've seen commodities, of course, coming under a little bit of pressure. But to Emmanuel's point, you know, we've, we've been here before. Absolutely, Anna. I mean, you know, even at the start of this year, we knew that China was going to be a little bit of a negative story. We just didn't know how exactly. Right, because at the start of the year, it was really all about those lockdowns and the potential supply chain issues we have, which we have seen at the earlier this year. And then it kind of morphed into a demand story when we heard from various companies, as you say, really worrying about the demand coming from such a big sector, uh, whether it's uh, luxury goods or, or manufacturing or anything like that. And then now, of course, the latest that we're hearing, apart from the Chengdu lockdown, is also the idea of China. 
China really becoming worried enough that they're going to be doing something about it through the monetary policy lever. And so all of these combinations really just amount to China probably being the biggest wild card for various investors and markets and perhaps potentially underpricing that fact that, you know, this is going to be a risk to stay perhaps throughout the rest of the year mm -hmm. and into next year. Yeah, and if we don't see any change in policy post-November and post those important meetings, that could be something that gets the market reassessing the risks uh, to the downside there. We do see some of those luxury names under pressure down 1.6, 1.7% as a result of this news flow. Let's broaden the conversation though, Emmanuel, and think about the, the broader picture for stocks. Of course, the Fed conversation very much to the center of things here. Uh, we've heard from Morgan Stanley's Mike Wilson. I spoke to him yesterday. We also know GMO's Jeremy Grantham, both of these voices talking about how we have not seen the bottom for stocks yet. Do you share that view? And if you do, why is that specifically? Because you get different views from different people. Morgan Stanley saying, for example, that they just think expectations around earnings are just way too optimistic still. So if you don't think we've seen the bottom, what's the explanation for you? Yeah, we agree with that. And to us, the, uh, the point that we have not yet seen the broad ramification of tighter monetary condition, right? So we've seen central banks now catching up with the reality. Inflation is here to stay. You know, not many people in this industry have uh, invested with double-digit inflation, right? And the central banks have to push hard on the break. And I think the the message, the takeaway from Jackson is very clear that you have to, you have to accept economic pain uh, and build trend growth for a long time to get inflation down, right? So, as I said before, the market has been hopeful of, um, of an improving growth policy mix in the summer. It did not basically materialize, and now I think the point is that uh, on top of weaker uh, or tighter monetary policy, you're going to get weaker growth. And, and in the past, when growth was weakening, you always had central banks coming to the rescue. So in the past 10 years, QE was a dominant force behind the market, and now we are missing this central bank put. So you have tighter policy and uh, earnings uh, growth slowing, which is basically a headwind for the equity market. And do you think we've got more of that slowing in growth uh, expectations? So I'm thinking here about margins and, 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 and revenue and, and profit expectations. Expectations. Do you think we need to factor in a slowdown more than we have done already? If the Fed is prepared to tolerate some pain, if we do see recessions in certain parts of the world, how, is, how much negativity is there still to be priced in for stocks, do you think? What we've seen this year is very much a valuation adjustment, right? So uh, all the overpriced assets have adjusted to tighter monetary condition this year, which is a first step in the right direction. But what we have not seen yet is a repricing in earnings expectations. So if you look at consensus estimate for next year, they look for pretty much double-digit growth in earnings pretty much everywhere and pretty much higher margin than this year. So the market is uh, expecting margins to be all-time high in 2023, which, you know, is very hard to achieve in the current circumstances. So we need to see this reset in earnings expectation and as something which could drive the final leg of the capitulation because positioning is definitely cleaner, right? There is much more caution in the market now, but we have not seen uh, retail investors, mutual funds in the U.S. selling their equity overweight. So mm. we need to get through this kind of adjustment, this capitulation, this washout before we have a much cleaner entry point. Yeah, I did speak to one guest yesterday who had a very bullish view on stocks or margin, you know, quite bullish view on stocks. And it did seem to stand out as being quite unusual right now. You don't find many people with those views. Christine, if we're going to be uh, talking about a Fed then that is prepared to tolerate some pain, then, I mean, soft landing is something that we talked about for some time. Maybe that is now off the radar. Maybe we can't hope for a soft uh, landing in the U.S. economy. A growth recession is the new, uh, the new phrase, the new buzzword that seems to be going around, uh, which I spoke to a PhD economist yesterday who'd never even heard of it. But uh, this is a, a, something that just suggests that we are not quite in a recession. We're still growing, but things are really sluggish, basically. I mean, this is the big question that hangs over every all asset classes right now. Absolutely, Anna. I think, you know, the recession discussion, it almost seems inevitable now that we are going to get that slowdown after after such a massive policy tightening shift, not just for the Fed, but really for a lot of major central banks around the world. And so now the question that would probably differentiate these various economies is how quick and how shallow is their recession going to be, you know? And that's probably what's going to set various economies apart. I mean, there was the sense in the U.S. that it could be potentially a short and shallow recession just because there are still signs of tightness in the labor market and potential pockets of strength in the consumer. They're not necessarily talking about, you know, capitulating on uh, their, their daily purchases. Maybe they're not going to be buying a new Peloton for Christmas. But <laughs> it's probably a different story over here in Europe, though, because as you know, the discussions are more probably negative because we do have this energy crisis hanging over us. And so it's not a question of, do I get a new Peloton? It's more, 
uh, how much am I going to have to pay for heating yes. and how much do I have to sacrifice for my food purchases? I, uh, I spoke to one uh, one friend recently who said they'd sold uh, sold a bike to pay for their gas bill. So that's uh, that's where we are in Europe, perhaps. Christine, thank you very much. Uh, but Christine Aquino joining us from the Markets Live team and Emmanuel Kaus stays with us here on the programme. Coming up on this programme, fighting inflation in Europe, the ECB mulls the prospect of jumbo rate hikes. More on that conversation next. This is Bloomberg. China's military power has been growing at an incredible speed over the last 20 years. A strong country must have a strong military, as only then can it guarantee the security of the nation. In terms of sphere of influence, we absolutely know that China wants to be dominant in Asia. So there is a target to get to that point, to be a military that is a peer to the greatest militaries in the world by 2035. The competition for influence is a global one and through a multi-decade trajectory fueled by planning, money, and pragmatism, China is building a military that allows it to shape the 21st century just as the U.S. shaped the 20th. Daybreak with Link. Bloomberg Radio. Welcome to Daybreak Australia. This is Bloomberg Technology. This is Bloomberg Green. On TV, radio, and the web, this is Bloomberg. My current view is that it will be necessary, necessary to move the Fed funds rate up to somewhat above 4% by early next year and hold it there. I do not anticipate the Fed cutting the Fed funds rate target next year hearing um, from central bankers and academics um, around the world, um, the clear priority was uh, bringing inflation down. And that really lines up with my own priority, um, being uh, president of the Dallas Fed and, and as a policymaker, you know, our number one priority um, has to be to restore uh, price stability. Fed presidents Laurie Logan and Loretta Mester there speaking about the fight against inflation. Let's stay on the central banking story and focus, though, on Europe, where ECB officials are under pressure to act more aggressively to fight inflation. Hikes of 125 basis points by October are being priced in, with at least one 75 basis point hike now fully baked in. Joining us now with analysis, let's get to Bloomberg's Lizzie Burden, who can take us through uh, the latest. Lizzie, is this a global phenomenon that's led to this, or is it ECB specific. Talk us through the detail. I would say that the Jackson Hole clear messaging from Jay Powell has clearly weighed on the ECB. But the reason why economists were hot on, were quick to change their calls yesterday from 50 basis points to 75 basis points, including Goldman Sachs, Bank of America and Bloomberg Economics, uh, was because of the euro area inflation print yesterday. The highest, a new record high, 9.1% uh, in August, despite oil prices falling 
falling. And not only that, it was broad-based, which implies that uh, inflation is going to last. But you've had so many hawkish comments out of the governing council at Jackson Hole and since. I think it's six governing council members now who've uh, said that more than a half-point hike needs to be considered at the next meeting. Uh, so that's why economists are changing their minds. But if you read these notes, the, the caveat is that this is going to be a close call between 50 and 75 because you heard Philip Lane, the chief economist, sounding a very cautious tone this week, saying that there needs to be a steady pace of hikes so as not to uh, set off Italy, which of course is going to be vulnerable to higher borrowing costs. Uh, so it's going to be a difficult decision mm. at the next meeting. Yeah, watching rates rise and watching those spreads, of course, carefully. On to the UK story, Lizzie, and we're going to get some data out from the Bank of England today, 9.30 a.m., so in just over an hour's time. How's that going to factor into the, the pace of hikes we see from the BOE? Yeah, it's a survey by the Bank of England of chief financial officers of businesses of all different sizes across the UK. And it's been increasingly important in the Monetary Policy Committee's decisions uh, because it's an indication of how much inflation is embedded in the UK. The last reading for the medium term uh, inflation expectations was 4.1%. So if it's still at that level, it's an uncomfortably high level uh, for the Bank of England to be reaching its 2% target and it would not only lay the foundations add to the foundations uh, for a half point hike from the BOE at its next meeting. Okay, uh, thanks very much, Lizzie Burden, with the latest on some of the European uh, themes, the European Central Banking themes specifically. Let's get back to Emmanuel Cow, Head of European Equity Strategy at Barclays. Emmanuel, we talked about the, the, the push higher in rates. We talked about the central banks being very hawkish, and that's on both sides of the Atlantic, it, se it seems. But we do have, because of other factors to do with energy, of course, extreme bearish, bearish positioning around European stocks, you point out in your notes. Do you see anything that changes that? I have to say, it's hard to see any silver lining from now. I mean, I think the bearish case on Europe is very much about this energy crisis and stagflation, right? So, you know, in the US, the Fed has to slow the economy in order to kind of, you know, get inflation down. I think the job of the ECB is much more complex because obviously there is not much they can do against this energy crisis. Um, so positioning is very bearish, sentiment is very bearish, and that's something which might prevent Europe to un from underperforming meaningfully compared to the US, which I think is more vulnerable to capitulation. But it's hard to convince anyone to invest in Europe as long as the threat of, of much more disruption is, is here to stay. So I guess one of the hope we have is that at some point you get the truth on the conflict in Ukraine, which could somewhat reduce the threat of a, of a broader and more painful uh, you know, energy shock on the economy. Yeah, wouldn't that be a positive development? Um, well, I spoke to a credit analyst yesterday, actually at UBS, who had an interesting view talking about the transatlantic divergence there. And he was saying that he, he is assuming a different or a sooner, quicker reaction function from the ECB, from the Fed, in terms of corporate distress. So if companies are getting themselves into trouble, he thinks that the ECB will be quicker to act in terms of liquidity and all of those things we've seen at times of crisis. Is that something that factors into your thinking? Because it's a very difficult situation for the ECB. They could be hiking into extreme weakness in the Eurozone economy. Well, which is what they are doing already. So the ECB is working a very, very fine line, and their mandate is very tricky because they have to focus on price stability but you also have a lot of unresolved imbalances in Europe, right? So whether I look at the peripheral bond market, which is still very dependent on uh, generous ACB liquidity, the corporate debt market might be stressed as well. Um, and, you know, you have this kind of ongoing stagflation pressure, which is hurting consumer price, you know, purchasing power, right? So we don't see the ECB going much higher than 1.5%. We think there's a long way to go uh, for the Fed. So there's a short window for the ECB to hike, and that's very much about uh, trying to keep credibility and maybe put a floor on the currency. Uh, but ultimately, we don't think they can go much further into a much lower growth uh, environment. Okay, so does that mean then that the interest rate differential play doesn't run for too long? Because that seems to be something that was supporting the euro, for example, at the beginning of this week. I don't know what the, the team at Barclays are saying about that, because you must have to make assumptions about where the euro heads when you're looking at the, the equity story. Well, we we are very much pro-dollar in our allocation. I mean, we think the dollar uh, is still very much supported by very hawkish Fed, and we don't see any central bank in the world who can really compete with what the Fed is, being, is doing. And on top of that, you know, given so much risk aversion outside the US, with, you know, UK having its own issues and Europe as well, and China, you know, it's very hard to see this kind of strong dollar trade reversing anytime soon. So from a positioning standpoint, no doubt the dollar is very crowded and very overowned, but fundamentally, 
we don't think there's anything that will you know, hurt this trade for now. Okay, Emmanuel, thank you very much for your time. Really good to see you. Emmanuel Cow joining us there, head of European Equity Strategy at Barclays. Coming up, we'll get back to UK politics. Liz Truss rules out introducing new taxes or energy rationing if she becomes Prime Minister here in the UK as she bids to beat her rival, Rishi Sunak, for the UK's top job. That story later this hour. This is Bloomberg. push have you seen from the Kishida government in terms of green funding? The Kishida administration has committed to doubling the amount of investments in so-called green technologies. I think we need more than just pronouncements. We need real money backing very innovative startups um, and innovative companies in this space. What do you make of Kishida's new capitalism? Well, I think his framework is reflective of the challenges that Japan society is facing, namely uh, that growth has been present, but growth has not been, of course, evenly distributed. But frankly speaking, it, it's hard to redistribute income if you don't have much income to begin with. If the government and private sector can work together and collaborate uh, to drive more in innovative growth startups, that, that can really drive uh, the income growth that the Kishida government needs to redistribute. Bloomberg has enhanced search on the terminal to deliver what you need when you need it. Now, you can simply type phrases in everyday English in the command line. Compare financials. Find people. Analyze markets. You can enter phrases or ask questions. What do you want to know today? Ask a question or visit SearchGo to find answers now. Welcome back to the European market open and it is 8.25 here in London, 9.25 in Paris or Berlin. European stocks moving lower this morning. Let's get a Bloomberg Business Flash. Here's Alice Atkins. Good morning, Alice. Morning, Anna. Nvidia shares fell in late trading after it warned that new rules governing the export of artificial intelligence chips to China may affect hundreds of millions of dollars in revenue. The stock dropped on the disclosure that the chip makers A100 and forthcoming H100 products will require approval from the US government before they can be sold to Chinese customers. 3M plans to eliminate jobs as part of a broader cost-cutting drive in response to the slowing U.S. economy. The scope of the cuts, flagged in an internal memo, is not yet clear. 3M has underperformed in recent years amid supply chain snags, currency fluctuations and rising costs. That's your Bloomberg Business Flash. Anna? Alice, thanks very much. Alice Atkins here in London. Coming up on the programme, we'll talk about the energy crisis in Europe. Germany's gas storage rises to 84% of capacity as Europe's largest economy scrambles to replace Russian supplies. We've heard from the German government that they uh, want to cut demand by 20%. They want to find alternative sources. Can they do enough? The storage story has been supporting, uh, or has been leading to, sorry, a, a fall in gas prices, which has come as something of a relief in recent days. How far can that go? We'll have more on the energy story, how it's playing out for Germany, and more broadly across Europe. We'll get to that next. This is Bloomberg.
The 700th anniversary of Dante Alighieri's death has triggered the work of many institutions and offered a very rich schedule of events. Today in Santa Croce, we present one of these projects that suffered a difficult start because COVID-19 has stopped the project that was shared by the Opera di Santi Croce by the Franciscan community from Florence Municipality and the Fund for Religious Building of the Internal Minister. Today, Felice Limosani's project is finally enjoyable. In the Pazzi Chapel, the marvelous architecture by Filippo Brunelleschi, the most important images from the Divine Comedy created by the French illustrator Gustave Doré. Through these images, we can live the violent emotions of hell, the weight of purgatory, and the sublime joy of paradise. The digital humanities are an occasion. The digital humanities are a cultural occasion to exploit. Summing up, it's about merging humanistic disciplines with new technologies. I find this to be an innovating and modern tool to update culture. Cultural heritage becomes something to hand over to the new generations and not to be put aside. So it's about using technology, pixels, and binary code with a human and humanizing content. Come down in Europe from the financial centers of the world. Bloomberg Markets European Close with Guy Johnson in London and Alex Steele in New York. Real time numbers, real time analysis. Weekdays. What is your base case for Italy in terms of what happens politically and what the economic fallout is? Welcome back to the European market open 30 minutes into your European trading session. Here are your top stories. Perilous predictions. The S&P drops nearly 18% on the year, but famed investor Jeremy Grantham says the super bubble he's been warning about is still yet to pop. Keeping up the pressure, yields rise as investors fully price in a 75 basis point ECB hike. The Fed's Loretta Mester says rates need to rise to above 4% from the Fed by early next year. Plus, Chengdu lockdown. China puts 21 million under new COVID measures, the biggest city to shut since Shanghai earlier this year. Welcome back to the program. Half an hour into the European trading session, and this is what the picture looks like then. The Stocks Europe 600 down by 1.2%. The DAX, the FTSE 100, both under pressure as well, down by 1.3% over in Germany. If we take a look at some of the sectors and the negativity that we have coming through in all sectors across uh, the European equity market space today, you can see that the broad sentiment is very much risk off. And the, the story that seems to be dominating this, actually, is around China. So adding in a new reminder of the risks posed by China and the, uh, the ongoing COVID policies there that result in periodic lockdowns. We're seeing that in chain too. 21 million people being put into those lockdown conditions. And that is having an impact on some of the European businesses that do well out of China or have done. That in particular is luxury goods. So consumer products and services is the worst performing sector here in Europe as a result. Basic resources also under pressure because we've seen some commodity prices dropping on lower global growth expectations again around that China story. To, well, I was going to say the upside, but they're not going higher, are they? But uh, least affected, we've got utilities and telecom comms. Perhaps a little bit of relief in some of the utilities that have a UK focus around some of the comments from the leading contender to be UK Prime Minister talking about not wanting windfall taxes on any further energy uh, businesses. We'll get to that conversation a little bit later. Let's get a Bloomberg First Word News update. Here's Alice Atkins. Hi, Anna. The Chinese metropolis of Chengdu has locked down its 21 million residents, forbidding them to leave their homes except in special circumstances. It's the biggest city to be locked down since Shanghai's bruising two-month crisis earlier this year as China continues its COVID zero battle. The country's vast western region until now has been largely untouched by the coronavirus. Liz Truss, the bookmaker's favourite to succeed Boris Johnson, has ruled out introducing any new taxes if she becomes the UK's next Prime Minister. At the final Conservative Party leadership hustings, Truss also said she would not introduce any new windfall taxes on the energy sector. The result of the election will be announced on Monday. 
A top UN official says China has committed serious human rights abuses against ethnic Muslims in the Xinjiang region and may be guilty of crimes against humanity. UN High Commissioner for Human Rights Michelle Bachelet cites testimony alleging patterns of torture as well as the demolition of holy sites. Beijing tried to block her report and says its actions in Xinjiang are aimed at clamping down on extremism and terrorism. Sarah Palin has lost a special congressional election in Alaska in a district that's been Republican-held for nearly five decades. Democrat Mary Peltola flipped the state's lone House seat, growing Democrats' majority in the narrowly divided U.S. chamber and setting up a rematch for the seat in November. Access to abortion was among the issues which saw Peltola narrowly beat the former Republican vice presidential candidate. Global News, 24 hours a day, on air and on Bloomberg Quick Take, powered by more than 2,700 journalists and analysts in more than 120 countries. This is Bloomberg. Anna? Alice, thanks very much. Alice Atkins with your first word news update. Now let's turn our attention to Europe's energy crisis, where governments are scrambling to secure gas supplies and replace unreliable Russian supplies. Germany is now reporting that its gas storage has risen to 84% of capacity. Let's talk to Claudia Kempfert, head of the Department of Energy, Transportation and Environment at the German Institute for Economic Research, DIW. Claudia, very nice to, to have you with us. What's your analysis of the state of storage and, and how that positions Germany going into the winter. Yeah, well, um, the state of storage is that it's quite full uh, because the German government did everything they could do to fill it and has, uh, I mean, spent it a lot of money to, to fill it and now it's 84%. It's above the plan the mm -hmm. German government had and I think it will be on plan to fill it by 90% by November. That's actually the plan and we can make it and that's a good that's a good signal because we need the storage uh, as full as possible in order to keep over the winter and uh, in, in addition to this also that the diversification of the gas imports has been done but on the other hand we have to do to save more gas uh, before winter. Yes. Uh, what what uh, what difference does that storage make, Claudia? Because of course, having storage full into winter will be a real positive. But at the same time, it takes more than just what Germany can store to provide enough gas through the winter. So, what kind of situation will Germany be in, even if storage is uh, is really strong? Well, yeah, we are still in the situation that the Nord Stream two Nord Stream one pipeline is not. There's no gas. Uh, uh, transported right now through through the pipeline. That's still the situation, but we do get gas from other countries, especially the diversification of imports has been done. We get more from Norway, from the Netherlands. So we will get also floating uh, terminals, liquefied gas terminals by winter. That helps us to come uh, to also to increase the supply in addition to what we might get also from, from Russia. But on the other hand, we have to do more to reduce the gas demand because uh, the industry, the economy in uh, total have redu has reduced already by 20% the gas demand. That's quite high because the gas prices are so high. And now we have to do more also to substitute gas in the, in the electricity sector, but also to do more to reduce the gas demand in the building sector with, uh, with the heating demand by winter. Do you think, Claudia, is this something that is going to, you, you've talked there about how businesses or industry has been doing its part and maybe this goes to the residential sector as well. Are individuals in Germany, are they doing enough? Are they feeling that they're under pressure to, to cut back? How are those messages being received? Well, the messages are there also by the media. However, the prices, the steep gas price uh, increases will come by winter. And right now, the steep uh, uh, gas price increases has been felt now by the industry, by the economy. This is why they reacted already and reduced the gas demand drastically. But on the other hand, uh, the heating sector, the uh, residential sector, will react. We will get a, we will get surely a very social debate uh, because uh, low-income households, poor households will be affected heavily. Right now, the government is debated also debating about some kind of compensation, financial compensation measures to the most affected households, but also to companies. And this will continue. So yes, the households, the debate is there, but we have to do more, especially in the residential sector, to reduce the gas demand here more heavily. 
Okay, so there's still work to do there. What about talk of, uh, of action being taken at European level, Claudia? We know a meeting's been called for a little bit later on this month, in a week or so, and we know there's talk of maybe putting some sort of cap on gas prices or trying to de-link gas and, and other, other energy products. What do you make of that conversation? Where should it go? Well, I think it's quite dangerous uh, to have a gas cap, a gas price cap, uh, because uh, we, what we need to do right now is to reduce the gas demand drastically. We have an electricity crisis in Europe, uh, also because of the French uh, nuclear reactors, which are not uh, in place at the moment. Uh, we have an energy and uh, crisis as well, and we have to reduce gas uh, drastically, not only in the electricity sector, but overall. And if the gas price is capped, we have to subsidize drastically this price. On the other hand, we do not enough uh, to reduce the gas demand, which brings us in a heavier gas crisis. So this is what we ne really need to do, is uh, to have a higher gas price, uh, although it's, it's quite, um, I mean, affected by households and, and we see the severe uh, impacts out of it. But on the other hand, we need to do more to uh, financially support and compensate most affected households and uh, companies. But a gas price cap here is a, is a wrong way. So this is hopefully what the German government will see is in, in that way and also will mm. uh, also make the debates in, in Europe in that way. Yeah. So hopefully we will not have yeah. a gas price cap in Europe. Okay, that's interesting because you could argue that maybe you should cap it at quite a high level, then you would still get that price signal, you'd still get that high price weighing on demand, and you would you, you would uh, you would not have such a, a large bill to pay by by the government to sort of fund that cap. You wouldn't even support a cap at a high level, then, Claudia. No, I would not support that. Uh, I can understand the argument, and this is a debate we have in Germany as well, but I really fear that we will get a severe gas crisis simply because the gas demand is not reduced enough. Uh, although, of course, there will be affected households, we have to do to compensate more, and, the, um, and also the compensation and the uh, subsidies to pay this gas price cap are really huge. We should pay this money really for most affected households and companies and not to have a gas price cap, although, I mean, I, I understand the debates, but I would not support it. So you would like something more targeted then, Claudia, more support for, for, for lower income households? Just, just leave it at that. Is that the way this should be dealt with in your view? Yeah. Right, right, right. This is this is a way we should go uh, to really targeted to financially support targeted most affected households, but also companies. Uh, but leave the gas price, leave the gas market uh, what they do because the market is functioning. We have an energy crisis, we have a gas crisis. The uh, the uh, supply is limited, and also the electricity markets and supply is limited, and the prices, uh, the price increases are a result and a signal out of it. And we need to keep the market going, on the other end, uh, help financially uh, the most affected households, but also companies, and do more uh, to compensate them and uh, not to cap prices, but to cap costs. That's really important. Claudia, thanks very much for your thoughts. Uh, good to speak to you. Claudia Kempfert, head of the Department of Energy, Transportation and Environment at the German Institute for Economic Research, DIW. Coming up on the programme, we'll talk about energy from a different angle, oil, in fact, as it recoils. Crude prices have slumped more than 20% in the last quarter. More on the world's most uh, important commodity next. This is Bloomberg. have been very popular and if a client came to you and said look I'd like some cryptocurrencies in my portfolio what would you say oh we've actually been really deep into crypto deep into learning about blockchain um, and all of the new businesses you know I would characterize this as um, crypto 
learners. You know, we have made a series of toehold investments on behalf of our clients, um, both in some of the currency baskets as well as with some venture firms um, that are investing primarily in the crypto area. Um, I, I think it has the potential to be completely game-changing, um, but it is still such the Wild West, and so it's so uncertain. But there's, it has the potential to completely upend everything. The top names at the Fed are on Bloomberg. I have a baseline case going into September that is 50 basis points. That's where I've been since the last meeting. But I have an open mind about whether okay. 75 is going to be necessary. 50-75 doesn't just depend on a data point, even an important one like the CPI. I like to say that we're data dependent. We're not data point dependent. Nobody covers the Fed like Bloomberg, your global business authority. set for the start of U.S. trading. Bloomberg, the open with Jonathan Farrell. Drilling down on the numbers and preparing you as only Bloomberg can. Weekdays on Bloomberg. Welcome back to the European Market Open. We are at 8.44 here in London, 9.44 in Paris or Berlin. Uh, so we're 44 minutes into our European trading day and things look negative across European markets. Still reeling from the latest lines around China and COVID, but also still dealing with uh, increasingly hawkish central bank policy and working that through into markets. Let me get to some breaking lines that are coming through uh, from Brussels. The EU's Deputy Director General for Energy is speaking in Brussels, telling us a few things we already knew, like the EU is looking at energy prices price caps, which we did already know, but also saying that there are some other things uh, that are going on. The EU is considering electricity demand reduction tools and also considering a windfall tax on energy companies. Now, we've had this at the, at the nation state level in some cases, but perhaps not at the EU level. So that'll be interesting to see. I know Italy and Spain already have uh, taxes in place in, in that vein, but we'll see how that one develops as we work towards that meeting on September the 9th. Now, sticking with commodities, oil is lower this morning as September trading gets underway. Demand concerns have escalated as China, the world's top importer of oil, locked down Chengdu on a, a flare-up of COVID cases. The volatile macro environment has investors shunning risk assets, including then commodities, pushing uh, the greenback higher, uh, so the, uh, the dollar is higher and uh, commodities are weaker this morning. Joining us for more is Bloomberg's European oil editor, James Heron. James, very nice to have you with us. So oil has been sliding, it's actually been sliding for a few months now, give or take a, a bit of volatility within that. Uh, does the slide in oil prices look set to continue? Uh, there's certainly the, the bearish forces, the demand concerns uh, don't look to ease anytime soon. Um, one of the reasons that prices were more buoyant during the summer was that people thought that China had COVID finally behind it. This latest flare-up shows that's not the case. And the, the anticipation of stronger demand from China was seen as offsetting the economic weakness in the Western economies. And so again, if you can't rely on sort of Chinese growth to offset that, then yeah, the demand picture looks quite weak for a few months to come, certainly. Okay, right. And we'll see what happens with China and its COVID policy into November and those important meetings taking place there. What about OPEC Plus and the way it responds then to this, uh, this current demand uh, picture? Because we've heard from the Saudi Arabians that uh, there was a possibility of cutting back production, even though President Biden went all the way to Saudi to ask them to, to boost production. We've got an important meeting coming on Monday. Yeah, and um, the comments from the Saudis really show how the, the calculus in the oil market has changed. For months and months and months, the pressure was all like, OPEC, we need more oil, the market's very tight. And suddenly, they've gone from increasing every month to thinking about cutting back. Now, whether we see that on Monday, um, it remains to be seen. That would be a very sharp U-turn for them. And the other thing that's going on is the negotiations between the West and Iran continue. Mm -hmm. The possibility that more production could come from Iran is still very uncertain at this stage. So they may wait and see what happens, at least for the next meeting. Okay. Uh, and what, what about the outlook for oil supply for the rest of the year? You've mentioned Iran. That's a bit of a wild card, perhaps. I was reading about questions around Libya. For a period, people had questions around Iraq, although maybe that's gone away. But what does the supply story look like? Uh, yeah, well, Iran, the Iran deal, we'll see things are happening again there, but we've been in this position before where we anticipated a deal and it never happened. Um, Iraq, too, there's a lot of political uh, 
turbulence there suddenly. Um, and of course, the, the big thing that we know is going to happen is by the end of the year, Europe is going to ban most purchases of Russian oil. Um, Russia has managed to adapt so far to other sanctions on its oil production, uh, oil exports, since the invasion of Ukraine. Whether or not it can do that again at a much bigger scale with the amount of oil that Europe will no longer be taken for it. So again, there's a question of like, there could be a big supply disruption, but maybe it could be smaller than people mm. perhaps anticipate. Yeah, on that front, I mean, does it just mean that different people buy Russian oil and the people who are not buying Russian oil buy, buy other oil? Are we just sort of shuffling the oil pack, if you like, rather than cutting back on production, this EU uh, rule change that comes in? Eventually, yes, but there's always a period of adaptation where supply chains and shipping take a while to adjust, so you may see a drop in Russian production and then a rebound. That's exactly what we saw when the initial round of sanctions came on in February, where it dropped quite low, and by the midsummer, it was almost back to pre-invasion levels. Mm. So we may see a similar trend again. Okay, James, thanks very much for your thoughts this morning. Bloomberg's European oil editor with the latest on oil dynamics, James Heron. Coming up on this program, we'll talk UK politics. Liz Truss rules out introducing new taxes on energy or energy rationing if she becomes prime minister as she makes her final pitch for the UK's top job. We'll find out on Monday who's got that top job. We'll get you analysis next. This is Bloomberg. Monday, the UK Conservative Party decides who will succeed Boris Johnson as prime minister. As Rishi Sunak and Liz Truss go head to head, keep it tuned to Bloomberg for the latest news and up to the minute results. Bloomberg, your global business authority. Welcome back to the Open. Eight minutes to nine here in London. So uh, just under an hour into the European Trading Day, and you can see European equity markets under pressure. Really, the uh, the story out of China taking the edge off the European Trading Day, that lockdown of uh, 21 million people certainly having an impact, and for an indefinite period. So we'll uh, keep an eye on the headlines out of China on that front. Let's take a look at some of the things that we are watching out for today. At 10 a.m. UK time, we will have the latest Italian GDP figures, so building a, a picture of uh, performance across the Eurozone. 
Zone. Also at 10 a.m., we will have Euro area unemployment numbers. Then at 1.30 p.m., we will have some data from the United States, including initial jobless claims. It's been a real week of focus on jobs, whether that's the JOLTS data or the ADP number. We are going to get uh, the, uh, the data I just mentioned today. And then, of course, non-farm payrolls tomorrow. And later, we will have results from the U.S. chip manufacturer Broadcom. Really interesting in the context of what NVIDIA said about its ability to export certain AI chips to China. Let us focus in on the UK though now and Liz Truss has promised not to introduce any new taxes on en or, or energy rationing this winter if she becomes Britain's next Prime Minister. That's still uncertain of course. She's currently Foreign Secretary. She's made the com commitments during the final Conservative Party leadership hustings last night in London. We will know the winner of the context, uh, contest on Monday. Joining us now with uh, analysis, Bloomberg's Ben Sills. So uh, Ben, what is Liz Truss's plan to tackle the energy Energy crisis. Do we have any detail uh, above and beyond saying, you know, we, we, we can do something? Well, we're starting to get a few little nuggets of information. Uh, um, our team on the ground in Westminster yesterday had a couple of quite important scoops. Um, we know that she's considering um, cutting business rates for small, small, small companies who have been particularly uh, hard hit by the rise in, in, in energy costs. And we also know that she's planning a raid on some of the renewable energy producers who've um, had a bit of a windfall from um, the surge in, surge in power prices. So there's, there was starting to get a slightly clearer picture. Okay, and how viable is that? It's interesting you mentioned that raid on renewable energy because she said of ruling out more taxes, but there are other ways, I suppose, that they claw back uh, that money. So, but how viable is the plan more broadly? Exactly. I mean, I think there are a lot of concerns about it. I think that the, the fundamental problem is the talk of tax cuts uh, at this stage of the game, um, with the UK likely heading towards a uh, recession. Um, and the Bank of England hiking rates has investors very worried. Pound fell 5% during August. That's its worst decline since the aftermath of the Brexit referendum in 2016. And blue chip um, British companies are now paying more than 5% to borrow in the market. So that's a, a real sign of market tensions building. And that's before she's even got through the door at number 10. Yeah, we spoke to Charlie Bean, who used to be at the Bank of England, of course, and at the OBR, and uh, now at the London School of Economics. And he was talking uh, yesterday about a risk premium now in gilt markets, so in uh, in UK uh, sovereign debt. So I guess that takes me to my next question, which is, what are the risks of this approach? Well, I think what the, the, the fundamental problem is that is that the UK budget deficit, the public finances, could could, could start to spiral. Um, government borrowing demands would increase, and that would just place a lot of a lot of strain on the on the sterling markets, which have already been in trouble. Kind of beyond that, on a political level, we can see that there are massive tensions in the Tory Party. There is not a consensus in the, within the parliamentary party behind what what Trust wants to do, and we've also seen quite strong indications that the Treasury officials, who are kind of in charge of steering the ship, you know, beyond. On the, the political cycle are, are, are going to be trying to maneuver her into um, hiking taxes on the energy companies uh, in order to shore up the pilot public finances. So, so, you know, political tensions as well as market tensions, it's going to be a rocky ride, I think, for the new Prime Minister. Yeah, it's going to be an interesting one then. Tax, not tax on uh, energy companies. We already have it on oil and gas, of course. there have been talk about extending it to, to various other power generating companies. Can they get money from them without calling it a tax rise? Let's see. Ben Sills, thank you very much. Bloomberg's Ben Sills with analysis as we head towards getting the results of that Tory leadership contest. We will know by Monday, by Monday afternoon, who is leader of the Conservative Party and who is the new UK Prime Minister. That is it for the European Market Open. Let's have a quick look at where we are on markets. Uh, the European equity picture looks pretty weak this morning. We're really weighed down by what's coming through from China. So a lockdown in Chengdu uh, and the importance of that part of the Chinese economy to certain Western businesses having an impact. We're certainly seeing some luxury goods companies, some Basic materials companies being affected by the latest lines on COVID out of China. You see stocks here at 600 down by 1.1%. Surveillance Early Edition is up next. This is Bloomberg.
somebody want to be a consultant? And what are all these consultants doing? Well, David, I think that we actually defy the label consultant because sometimes consultant seems to imply that we only give advice. And when you look at what Accenture does, we're really different than the traditional version of a consultant. We're really about relevance and results. And that's what is uh, driving our business. What about a consulting project? In my example, I'm the CEO. I have a problem. I call you up. I say, solve my problem or give me a solution. We don't operate as big companies permanently in crisis mode. And so when you think about like how long does it solve things, a lot of it starts with you know, the company being willing to set aggressive goals. And so what we are trying to do now is work with our clients to work differently and to work faster. the financial world on demand. Hear from leading economists, policymakers, and industry experts via live and on-demand webinars only from Bloomberg. Start exploring to see what's moving the markets. Visit Bloomberg.com webinars. securities to Miami. The scoop was broken by Bloomberg's Amanda Gordon. That it would be necessary, necessary to move the Fed funds rate up to somewhat above 4% by early next year and hold it there. As a policymaker, you know, our number one priority um, has to be to restore uh, price stability. I do not anticipate the Fed cutting the Fed funds rate target next year. This is Bloomberg Surveillance, early edition with Francine Lacroix. Good morning and welcome to Bloomberg Surveillance, early edition. I'm Danny Berger in London, in for Francine. Here's what's coming up on today's program. Perilous predictions, the S&P drops nearly 18% on the year. The famed investor Jeremy Grantham says the super bubble he's been warning about is still yet to pop. Keeping up the pressure, yields rise as investors fully price in a 75 basis point from the ECB. The Fed's Loretta Messer says rates need to rise above 4% by early next year. Plus, Chengdu lockdowns. China puts 21 million under new COVID measures, the biggest city to shut since Shanghai earlier this year. Well, it's a gloomy day, and we are getting euro area manufacturing data coming in basically in line, if not slightly, slightly weaker. 49.6 is where it's coming in. The preliminary figure was 49.7. So not too much change there, but it is a gloomy day. Overall dominated by some of the negative stories coming out of China, be it a new lockdown, be it also concerns on chip makers. NVIDIA warning on their profit, given some of the U.S. regulations on selling artificial intelligence to China. So that means over Overall, we have a down day so far, about an hour into cash trading, down more than 1% for the euro stock 600. Yields basically unchanged, but that two-year yield still at a punchy level, right below 3.5%. So we are looking at, you know, not even a rise of one basis point. But even so, that lift higher in the front end of the curve has been enough to lift the dollar and make that rate differential, say, with Japan become even more painful. That's why we're seeing the yen continue to fall. We're getting ever closer to that. At 140 level versus the dollar. It says it's up now because, of course, dollar at the front of this pair. 139.3 is where we stand. That's a rise of about a quarter of 1%. You also have the Bloomberg dollar again. It's overall a strong dollar story. Continues to be the only haven we can look for. So turning to Europe, you won't find many havens in this equity market. It is a painful day. Red, basically, anywhere. Honestly, I'm, I'm hard pressed to find anywhere in Europe that isn't deeply in the red or selling off more than 1%. UK down 1%. Cacarone down more than 1%. The DAX and the FTSE MIB 
all of them under pressure today. So it looks at least so far like we're headed for another day of losses. So that's the public story, but what about the private story? Coming up later in the show, we're gonna be speaking to Brookfield, which is seeking to ramp up its exposure in Europe. We're gonna talk equities, we're gonna talk tech investing in private equity and much more with Managing Director Anuj Ranjan. That will be about 9.30 a.m. London time. Now, traders, they are confronting the prospect of even bigger rate increases from the ECB. Hikes of 125 basis points by October are being priced in with at least 175 basis point hike now fully baked in. At the same time, the Fed's Loretta Messer and Lori Logan have reiterated their determination to get inflation under control. My current view is that it will be necessary, necessary to move the Fed funds rate up to somewhat above 4% by early next year and hold it there. I do not anticipate the Fed cutting the Fed funds rate target next year. Hearing um, from central bankers and academics um, around the world, um, the clear priority was uh, bringing inflation down. And that really lines up with my own priority, um, being uh, president of the Dallas Fed and and as a policymaker, you know, our number one priority um, has to be to restore uh, price stability. Well, we've got the all-star team out for you to discuss. We have John Bilton, head of global multi-asset strategy at J.P. Morgan Asset Management, and Christine Aquino from our markets team. Um, Christine, fresh off your New York trip, so it only feels right to talk to you about U.S. assets. Look, we, we continue to see this pressure in yields, having this big impact, be it the yen, be it equities. We're starting off fresh with the month of September. I mean, at what point do we call time? At what point do we say we're willing to buy the dip? Well, Danny, that was the narrative over the summer, right? But clearly, it has proven very temporary because, again, we're revisiting kind of the fears that we had at the start of the summer, which is essentially that the Fed and other major central banks are really going to be embarking on this massive tightening cycle and will be prioritizing inflation despite all the growth warnings, the recession warnings that we've been given. And, you know, over the summer, that narrative kind of faded, particularly in when I was in New York, you know, there was definitely this narrative of peak inflation, maybe things aren't so bad. But again, we get a fresh reminder from the Fed speakers that we've seen this week, from the ECB pricing that we've seen this week. 75 basis points is probably the new game in town that we're looking for now. I gotta say, John, it feels like a lot of people have that same feeling that Christine's laying out at the moment. This idea that markets still need to reprice. Jeremy Grantham says that, you know, the super bubble hasn't popped yet. Mike Wilson, yes, he's a perma bear, but keeps saying that we need to go lower. Do we need to retest those June lows? Does that make sense to you? I think it does, because I think it's a couple of things that happen. First and foremost, the earnings revision cycle has only really just gotten underway. Historically, you have to be half to two-thirds of the way through that downgrade cycle before stocks find a base. And then this whole sort of summer exuberance, it felt a little bit like the Mamma Mia sort of dancing scene with markets just thinking, this is getting better. And then it's suddenly come down to earth with a bump following uh, the Jackson Hole speech. And we've remembered that the Fed have a job to keep inflation under control. And with employment looking good in the States, they can be laser focused on inflation. And of course, what that means, all of a sudden, the valuation support, even in the face of weaker earnings, suddenly isn't there anymore. So yes, I'm sorry to say, I do think that we've got a little bit more of a torrid autumn ahead of us with regard to stocks. And now I have ABBA stuck in my head, so thank you for that, John. I mean, look, you know, Christina, I, I think it is interesting, kind of what John's talking about, this idea that it's the Fed coupled with earnings. It's the margin compression at the same time that easy money is gone. Where, where do we stand on analyst revisions for earnings, what expectations are? I mean, do, do they have the bad news priced in? I, I would tend to agree with John. I think sentiment really, when it comes to earnings expectations, still has to uh, quite a way to to go down, and that's probably the most difficult aspect of equity sentiment overall. That's that's uh, it's, it's the hardest to change, right? Because you will have the eternal optimist, particularly in the equity markets. Again, trying to push that narrative and believing that maybe, maybe, just maybe, there's a way that the Fed can achieve the soft landing without us plunging into a recession, or even if we do get a recession, it'll be short and shallow. We've definitely heard that phrase a lot of times from uh, the optimists in the market. But again, the reality is that those expectations when it comes to earnings growth moving forward really haven't budged all that much mm -hmm. despite the bad news that we've seen throughout the, the, the year so far. And so I think that's where that, that pressure will come from this autumn. And, you know, once we get that, that sentiment clean out by the end of the year, perhaps that's when we can start seeing a little bit more green shoots heading into 2023. Yeah, the sentiment cleanup, I feel like we've had so many 
many head fakes with that one. I mean, especially, I, I got to turn to Europe because if we're talking gloom and doom, it feels John that like Europe is, is the center of it right now. European stocks, they've obviously have been under a lot of pressure. Are you tempted at all by valuations or is this just a region you don't want to touch? Oh, my goodness. Um, yes, of course I'm tempted by valuations. And look, Europe, it, this is not the same Europe that we were dealing with back in the 2010s. This is a Europe with a solid banking sector, decent uh, you know, you know, regulatory reforms that have gone through, you know, decent household balance sheets and good corporations. And it's a very much more balanced market than it was sectorally. The thing is, it's cheap. Earnings actually have got some operating leverage to them if and when Europe does get through the uh, you know, probable recession that's ahead of it. But most importantly, there's just too much hair on this at the moment. There's mm. just a little bit too much in way of event risk, whether it's from energy, whether it's from policy, etc. And I think until that clears, it's cheap for a reason. But I would push back on those who think that Europe is that kind of structural underweight. Mm. I do believe Europe will be one of the winners when we get to the next cycle. Interesting. But We've just got to have some patience here and now. Yeah, still a lot of unknowns. And uh, I'm seeing now uh, von der Leyen saying that they're going to outline their power plan in se on a September 14th speech. So even that, we, we mm -hmm. still have to wait a little bit more. And Christine, this seems to be one of the, you know, the prevailing factors in terms of the concern about Europe is what's going to be the energy story. Until then, what happens to these energy-intensive industries, ones that are looking at demand rationing going forward? Well, Danny, I think we can expect a pressure moving forward, particularly as we head into the winter time. I mean, really, this growing energy crisis has been a bit of a specter over most European assets, whether it's in equities or the euro. And there is very good reason to as to why the euro at the moment is still hovering around that parity level, despite the fact that we've had this massive repricing in the ECB rate hike expectations because that in itself would you would think that would be negative or positive for the right. currency but because there's this big counterweight of the energy crisis a lot of uncertainty is still there we don't really know you know what's the plan <laughs> heading into the winter still and that's definitely weighing on sentiment on European assets in yeah, general. That mechanism of higher yields lifting the currency is just not happening in this environment. Christine thank you so much for joining as always that's Christine Aquino and John you're not getting a break stick around we're keeping you John Bilton head of global multi-asset strategy at JP Morgan Asset Management. Now coming up, China puts 20 million, 21 million people under new COVID measures in the mega city of Chengdu. We're looking at the latest next. This is Bloomberg. China's military power has been growing at an incredible speed over the last 20 years. A strong country must have a strong military, as only then can it guarantee the security of the nation. In terms of sphere of influence, we absolutely know that China wants to be dominant in Asia. So there is a target to get to that point, to be a military that is a peer to the greatest militaries in the world by 2035. The competition for influence is a global one and through a multi-decade trajectory fueled by planning, money, and pragmatism, China is building a military that allows it to shape the 21st century just as the U.S. shaped the 20th. No one covers the world like Bloomberg. We have to get interest rates higher and bring inflation back to our targets. Their capacity is becoming scarce. We are running on thin ice. No one deliberately wants to go into battle, but we sleep walk into conflict. With unmatched reach and resources from more than 120 countries, the moment news breaks, 24 hours a day. Bloomberg, your global business authority.
economics, finance, politics. This is Bloomberg Surveillance Early Edition. I'm Danny Berger in London. China will impose its biggest COVID lockdown since Shanghai, starting from 6 p.m. local time today, with the measures in place indefinitely. Chengdu's 21 million residents will need a negative test to leave the city, and families will be allowed to send only one person out once per day for groceries. Joining us now is Bloomberg's China health reporter, Linda Liu. Um, you know, Linda, it's, it's already a very challenging summer being faced by residents and businesses in Chengdu, which of course is the capital of the uh, Sichuan province province. How does this add to those headaches? Yes, uh, Chengdu residents have been uh, facing a very tough time recently um, because uh, China is experiencing its worst drought in history. So Chengdu has, as well as other parts of the Sichuan province, have been experiencing rolling power cuts. Uh, people haven't had air conditioning to cool them down. So it's making conditions quite tough, as well as um, for businesses, the rolling power cuts have been impacting production there. So now that you have a COVID lockdown on top of that, um, the energy supply use with everybody at home is going to go up. So that's going to be a question for how people are going to manage with that. And uh, Chengdu um, will also be undergoing a mass testing campaign in the next three days. With the heat that is going on outside, uh, people will have to queue for hours um, in the sun. So um, it's going to be quite, um, quite a tough challenge for the residents there. And, and of course, we have the uh, Party Congress coming in October. How does continued COVID flare-ups change the political calculus? So uh, the Communist Party um, has uh, always maintained that the COVID zero policy, which is um, you know employing uh, employing snap lockdowns, uh, quarantining confirmed cases as well as close contacts to cut off transmissions, uh, these have had success in stamping out infections, but they are getting more and more costly as you have uh, more contagious uh, variants of the coronavirus um, breaching defenses in China. So we've seen um, Shanghai went through a really grueling two months lockdown uh, in spring. So there was a lot of suffering there. So there's a big uh, swell of criticism against COVID zero. And um, the hope is from a lot of businesses, as well as the public, that the upcoming party Congress could be a meeting in which China's leadership could take some of these feedback into account and change the direction of how the country is going to manage COVID going forward. But um, that's all speculation. As President Xi Jinping has firmly committed to the COVID zero policy mm. for political as well as um, uh, health reasons. Okay, Linda, thank you very much. That's Bloomberg's Linda Liu in Hong Kong, keeping us up to date. John Bilton, head of global multi-asset strategy at JP Morgan Asset Management, is still with us. And, and John, you know, when we're talking about attractive valuations, things that have sold off a lot, it's hard not to put China mm. in that conversation. Now, previously it had been, okay, perhaps there'll be some lifting of COVID measures, and that's this big catalyst to buy. I mean, it seems like we're really far from that. Yeah, I mean, I think that if you look back at the beginning of the summer, China had a pretty aggressive snap upwards mm. um, because and a lot of that was technically led, as you rightly say, earnings expectations on their knees, valuations inexpensive and positioning washed out. So a little bit of good news went an awfully long way. What we didn't get was follow through because remember, China is you know, the counter to the US and, the Euro and Europe where it doesn't have the inflation issues that we're facing in these regions. It has capacity to stimulate. Yet the stimulus that we got, the commitment to growth targets, which have been laid out at the beginning of the year, was notable by its absence. And when that comes through, you've kind of got to assume, well, look, China's inexpensive at the moment. Earnings expectations are pretty low, but it may well be a 2023 story hmm. before you can start to see some healing around the COVID policies and some more stimulus coming through. So again, as your reporter rightly pointed out, the Party Congress is incredibly important. So it's one of those ones you don't want to get caught short in for certain. But I still feel that we've got a little bit of uncertainty to work through, hmm. particularly with regard to stimulus. And, and, and John, also shame on me, because I do feel like I've been framing the conversation a bit in, in terms of equity. But, but you prefer credit to equity. Walk me through why. Yeah, well, we do. Um, broadly speaking, look, risk assets in general 
general, when you get weakening growth, are going to go down together. But there's a lot more support for the balance sheet today than there is for the income statement. We're seeing earnings getting cut. We're seeing margins under pressure, costs going up for corporations, households, the like. But bear in mind, through COVID, there was a lot of terming out of borrowing. Balance sheets are in good shape. We've already had a lot of default cycles in energy, and energy is not the problem this mm. time around. And actually, if we look at where we stand today, the normal pattern that would apply to credit over a recession may well not hold this time. So sure, credit spreads could widen if we get weakness in the stock market, but we would argue that it's likely to be more contained, and actually that's where the bargains may be able to be found. As we start to get some confidence coming back in, as we get a more sensible pricing of the mm. outlook, that could be the first place to be starting to look right. to get back into risk. I do think that energy portion of it is really fascinating and just, just how different this cycle is. Does 100%. that also mean we just kind of skip the default part of this cycle then? Well, look, I mean, you know, as credit, as, excuse me, as capital gets harder to come by, you know, there's always going to be those who are starved of capital and, you know, end up in a default situation. But bear in mind, we went through a period of weakness through COVID, which cleaned out some of the weaker um, firms. And the big clean out that happened back in 2015, it, the weakness in the commodity markets then, also meant that you've got much safer balance sheets. You've got higher credit quality across the high yield segment. US high yield is more than 50% double Bs today. So the reality is, we're looking at a very different index. So historical comparisons, while always incredibly important, need to be adjusted for that sector and that ratings mix. And, and, and I just got to squeeze this in. We don't have too much time here, John. But if you are favoring investment grade over high yield, does there first need to be more pricing in of rate risk as we look? You know, Mester yesterday, for example, saying we got to go to 4%, maybe beyond. We're not going to cut our target. Mm. I mean, I think we've probably, we've seen the price action in the, um, in the belly of the U.S. curve. And once you get up towards that three-quarter, three-and-a-half kind of level, it seems to run out of steam. Because at that particular point, the attractiveness of actually starting to hedge out liability streams brings a whole block of buyers back in to both higher grade credit and also to duration. So remember, it's not just about the rate outlook, it's about what people do with those instruments. Mm. And not everybody is looking for a price return. Some are looking for cash flow management. And at 3.5%, it's very, very attractive relative to where it's been over the last 10 years. All right, John, afraid we're just out of time. Really great to get your thoughts this morning. Thank you. Thanks for joining us. John Bilton there, head of global multi-asset strategy at J.P. Morgan Asset Management. Now, coming up later in the show, Brookfield seeks to ramp up its exposure in Europe. We're going to talk private equity and much more with managing director Anuj Ranjan. This is Bloomberg. push have you seen from the Kishida government in terms of green funding? The Kishida administration has committed to doubling the amount of investments in so-called green technologies. I think we need more than just pronouncements. We need real money backing very innovative startups um, and innovative companies in this space. What do you make of Kishida's new capitalism? Well, I think his framework is reflective of the challenges that Japan society is facing, namely uh, that growth has been present, but growth has not been, of course, evenly distributed. But frankly speaking, it's hard to redistribute income if you don't have much income to begin with. If the government and private sector can work together and collaborate uh, to drive more in innovative 
growth startups, that that can really drive uh, the income growth that the Kishida government needs to redistribute. The difference between missed opportunity and actionable intelligence. For in-house attorneys who strive to provide superior counsel and strategic advice, Bloomberg Law offers an unmatched platform of analytics tools and business intelligence. All to help improve productivity, mitigate risk, and inform decision-making. For the comprehensive platform that helps you work smarter and faster, the difference is Bloomberg Law. Markets come down in Europe from the financial centers of the world. Bloomberg Markets European Close with Guy Johnson in London and Alex Steele in New York. Real-time numbers, real-time analysis, weekdays. Economics, finance, politics. This is Bloomberg Surveillance Early Edition. I'm Danny Berger in London. Now, uh, Bloomberg scoop with Russia mulling buying as much as $70 billion of friendly currencies. That includes the yuan. Now, eventually, they would shift to a longer-term strategy, according to people familiar, to sell its holdings of the Chinese currency. That would be to fund investment. Now, this plan, again, seen by Bloomberg, won initial support at a meeting. Um, and let me just read to you a quick line from this presentation they have on it, that the frozen $300 billion were of no help to Russia on the contrary, they became a vulnerability and a symbol of missed opportunities. Let's get to our other top news now. With the Bloomberg First Word is Leanne Gerens. Leanne. Good morning, Danny. Liz Truss, the bookmaker's favorite to succeed Boris Johnson, has ruled out introducing any new taxes if she becomes the UK's next prime minister. At the final Conservative Party leadership hustings, Truss also said she would not introduce any new windfall taxes on the energy sector. The results of that election will be announced on Monday. Now a top UN official says China has committed serious human rights abuses against ethnic Muslims in the Xinjiang region and may be guilty of crimes against humanity. The UN High Commissioner for Human Rights, Michelle Bachelet, cites testimonies alleging patterns of torture as well as the demolition of holy sites. Beijing tried to block her report and says its actions in the region are aimed at clamping down on both extremism and terrorism. Global news 24 hours a day on air and on Bloomberg Quick Take, powered by more than 2,700 journalists and analysts in more than 120 countries. I'm Leanne Gerens. This is Bloomberg. Danny. Leanne, thanks so much. Coming up, we're going to be speaking to Brookfield as they ramp up their exposure to Europe. We talk private equity next. This is Bloomberg. said, look, I'd like some cryptocurrencies in my portfolio, what would you say? Oh, we've actually been really deep into crypto, deep into learning about blockchain um, and all of the new businesses. You know, I would characterize us as um, crypto learners. You know, we have made a series of toehold investments on behalf of our clients, um, both in some of the currency baskets as well as with some venture firms um, that are investing primarily in the crypto area. Um, I, I think it has the potential to be 
completely game changing. Um, but it is still such the wild west, and so it's so uncertain. But there's, it has the potential to completely upend everything. Start of U.S. trading. Bloomberg The Open with Jonathan Farrell. Drilling down in the numbers and preparing you as only Bloomberg can. Weekdays on Bloomberg. predictions the S&P drops nearly 18% on the year the famed investor Jeremy Grantham says the super bubble he's warning about has yet to pop keeping up the pressure yields rise as investors fully price in a 75 basis point hike from the ECB the Fed's Loretta Mester says rates need to rise above 4% by early next year plus Chengdu lockdowns China puts 21 million people under new COVID measures the biggest city to shut since Shanghai earlier this year. Good morning. Welcome to Bloomberg Surveillance Early Edition. I'm Danny Berger in London. Now let's turn to the world of private capital, and Brookfield is seeking to ramp up its exposure in Europe. The Canadian investment firm plans to open an office in Germany as it looks to tap deal opportunities in Europe's powerhouse. Well, I'm pleased to say we're now joined by Anuj Ranjan, managing partner at Brookfield. Anuj, thanks so much for joining us. And I feel like you sort of encapsulate this push for Europe since you are based uh, here in London. I wonder, as you look to move more into Europe, open offices, make more investments, how does the prospect of a downturn in the nations, in the continent, color those decisions? Well, thank you for having me, Danny. And there could not be a better time to be a value investor. Um, the There are many headwinds, as you just described. Uh, the market can, in many ways, not look pretty. But in fact, for a group like us, who's a long-term investor, prioritizes investing in cash flow generative assets and businesses, this environment actually limits competition and creates a ton of opportunity. I mean, we're now sitting on over $110 billion of cash and available capital. It's the most we've ever had in our history. And I think now is a very opportune time to have that kind of dry powder available for, for a market like Europe, where mm. some of these things are, are uh, more challenging. Are, are people willing to sell right now? Because I, I ask that because I especially think of, of, of other private equity funds who maybe are looking at the prospect of selling at, at a pretty depressed multiple compared to what they bought at. Uh, who is selling and, and are they? Is, are, is, are the deals plentiful even if you want them? Well, Europe does slow down in August, so it's been not as active as it used to be. But, you know, we very, in the last 18 months, have put $30 billion to work. Uh, we did an acquisition very recently in uh, Deutsche Telekom's tower units in Germany. And uh, prior to that, we bought a company called Modulaire, pan-European leader in leasing ser modular leasing services for $5 billion. So we're putting capital to work. We're finding opportunities. Yes, there are those who aren't feeling any pressure to sell, probably aren't. If you mm -hmm. can hold on to an asset, if you have a long-term view, you probably would hold. But uh, Is that what we're seeing, private equity holding for longer? I would say in most cases, private equity sponsors that aren't uh, do not have uh, an issue in the debt markets would hold for longer. Well, what are the ramifications of that, of companies being private for longer? You know, if you've bought a business, as we often do, prioritizing the cash flows, and you underwrote situations like this, you took a long-term view, you're fine holding businesses for longer because they're generating cash. In, in situations where a business is not generating as much cash, you're not able to pull out that dividend or that yield, you might be in a m more of a challenging situation. Mm. And in, in terms of sort of your sector mix, when folks think about Brookfield, they probably think about, you know, industrials. They, of course, think about the infrastructure segment of Brookfield as well. Do you need to shift away from that if you are looking at especially, you know, capital-intensive energy uh, industries, industries that need to use a lot of energy when it's really expensive right now, that prospect being a difficult one in this environment? 
So we have been investing in new sectors. Uh, Technology is one where we've made a, a large uh, investment, many large investments, been growing fairly significantly. But uh, the type of technology we invest in is what I like to call an industrial technology. This is cash flow generative, generative, mature, profitable businesses that provide essential products and services that are hard to be replaced or replicated. Um, you know, it doesn't matter what new shiny toy comes out, no one's replacing their Bloomberg terminals. <laughs> in the same way, we like to invest in businesses that are very sticky, even if they are tech. So they have the same characteristics as an industrial or an infrastructure company. And uh, we recently acquired a company called CDK in the US, $8.3 billion. This company has 70% market share of large US auto dealerships. Mm. And so it's not going away, nothing's changing. Do they um, trade like tech or industrials though? And that's the great thing, is that the NASDAQ being down of 25% this year, yeah. um, it has brought some of the great tech names down with it. And that was a public to private where we thought it was a pretty uh, great opportunity, I think in uh, time, we'll look back and see it was maybe one of our best investments. Well, this, this goes back to this idea of, you know, are private investors selling? Is it, are we going to look back on 2022 as, you know, the year of take privates where that's where the most ample opportunity is? I think we could. Um, in 2008 and 2009, many firms like ourselves and, and many others actually made some of their best investments. Uh, these cycles, again, if you take a long-term view, as long as you underwrite and you plan for the uh, bumps in the road that we have ahead, uh, this would be a great time to, public markets are not valuing businesses the way the private markets are. Sometimes they're valuing them better, and at that time you see a lot of IPOs. Today, I think private sponsors should be doing more public mm. to privates. So when you are having the conversations with your portfolio companies, again, I, I go back especially to this idea, maybe not the tech ones, but ones that are having to deal with high inflation, with energy costs. When you're looking at a scenario of, let's say, demand rationing in areas like Germany, which you're pushing more into, Absolutely. what do those conversations look like? What, do, what does the playbook look like for the emergency scenario? So in this case, you know, we've, uh, we've always followed a mantra of investing in businesses where we underwrote a downturn from the beginning. For 12 years, maybe that hasn't always happened, but what it did mean was we bought businesses that were resilient, high quality, and generated cash. And uh, as uh, Howard Marks once said, uh, always uh, never forget the six-foot man who died crossing the stream that was on average five feet deep. <laughs> we like to plan ahead for these environments, and so our businesses that we own today, our portfolio is quite resilient. That same approach, if we apply it as a long-term investor, if we just look at the long-term cash flows, these, this next six to 12 months, as difficult as it might be, will not make a huge impact on the total value of the I business see. over time. D does that mean you need to pull those levers, like cutting costs, rising prices, price, passing prices along? Is that happening more now? Uh, great businesses that are mission critical and provide an essential product or service can pass on those price increases. We are seeing that happen in many cases. Um, in many cases, we actually are implementing, we always implement an operational improvement plan. It's where we think we get the majority of our returns. Mm. It's always been our thesis, our fundamental underwriting thesis, even in technology. And uh, it's where we continue to see opportunity today. So I, I got to press you just finally on, on one thing your CEO said in, in the earnings call last. He talked about, you know, private equity being among the most difficult to fundraise with in private capital right now. When you're having conversations with LPs, with investors, kind of what are, what are their biggest fears right now? What, what do you need to calm them of and assuage them of in this current environment? Look, they, they want to see cash flow. And I think um, buying businesses that generate a lot of cash that are highly cash generative and withstand the test of time is very important. Thankfully, that's an area we spend a lot of time in. And I think they are they're consolidating amongst uh, a few managers who have the capability, have a global setup, have a deep operational capability to deliver these returns. Mm. All right. Anuj, I'm afraid that's all we have time for. Thank you so much Thank you very for much. joining us. Great to have you on the program. Great to Anuj Ranjan there, Managing Director at Brookfield. Let's get now to your Bloomberg Business Flash. With that is Leanne Gerens. Good morning, Leanne. Hi, Danny. Nvidia shares fell in late trading after it warned that new rules governing the export of artificial intelligence chips to China may affect hundreds of millions of dollars in revenue. The stock dropped on the disclosure that the chip makers A100 and forthcoming H100 products will require approval from the US government before they can be sold to Chinese customers. Now, Australia's home prices saw their largest monthly drop in almost four decades in August. 
CoreLogic reports that prices in Sydney, the country's largest market, slid 2.3%, with Melbourne dropping 1.2%. The national index registered its biggest decline since 1983, with rising interest rates expected to drive further falls both this year and next. The Italian government's plans to sell the airline that emerged from the ashes of the troubled former flag carrier Alitalia may be dead on arrival. That's after Georgia Maloney, the leader of the right-wing bloc that's expected to win the upcoming election, said she's opposed to selling state-owned ETA Airways to an investor group including Air France, KLM and Delta. Now, 3M plans to eliminate jobs as part of a broader cost-cutting drive in response to the slowing U.S. economy. The scope of the cuts flagged in an internal memo is not yet clear. 3M has underperformed in recent years amid supply chain snags, currency fluctuations and also rising costs. And that's your Bloomberg Business Flash. Danny. Leanne, thank you so much. Well, let's get more on the central bank story and focus in on Europe, where ECB officials are under pressure to act more aggressively to fight inflation. Hikes of 125 basis points by October being priced in, with at least one 75 bit hike now fully priced. Joining us now is Bloomberg's Lizzie Burden. I mean, Lizzie, these markets adjusting quickly, what's led to it? Well, economists as well have changed their calls from 50 basis points to 75 basis points, and they did it in quick succession after that euro area inflation print yesterday, hitting an all-time, new all-time high at 9.1% in August. And of course, it's not just, uh, it, it's broad-based, put it that way, which means that this inflation is likely to last. It came despite the fall in oil prices. But it's not just because of the raw data, it's also because of all this hawkish commentary that we've had out of the ECB uh, at Jackson Hole and since. I think it's six governing council members now who've said that they want at, at least a discussion of more than a half point hike. And you've heard the, the Fed as well being so hawkish. It's already done two 75 basis point hikes, which is difficult for the uh, governing council to ignore and not feel behind the curve. But in these economists' notes, they emphasize that it's a close call because, of course, we had Philip Blaine, the chief economist, very influential, calling for a cautious approach. And that's largely because of the risk to Italy, given its uh, exposure to borrowing, higher borrowing costs. Right. And Lizzie, I know you've had to do some fast reading because just minutes ago we had the BOE publishing that decision makers survey poll. Mm -hmm. um, walk us through it. Was anything particularly interesting in there that especially might influence their uh, decision making? Yeah, so looking ahead, the CFOs of businesses of all different sizes uh, are seeing inflation CPI to be 8.4% one year ahead, up from 7.3% in the July survey, and 4.2% in three years' time. So this is higher than the last reading, which already uh, was considered to be above the level that's comfortable for the Bank of England to be reaching its inflation target. This print is important to the Monetary Policy Committee ahead of its September meeting because it shows how much inflation will be embedded, it's become an increasingly important indicator to the MPC. So it really does add to the case for a half point hike from the BOE in September. And, and talk to me about where we stand when it comes to the politics front on the UK. The next, uh, the front runner for the race, of course, ruling out uh, tax increases last night. Yeah, we heard from both the candidates at the London hustings yesterday, Liz Truss and Rishi Sunak. Liz Truss not only saying that she wants tax cuts, but also ruling out tax rises. And that's despite, if you remember, this Bloomberg scoop, which said that if the windfall tax were continued, it would generate tens of billions of pounds of revenue to help with the cost of living crisis because of the excess profits of energy companies. Instead, Truss is saying that she wants tax cuts and a new one on the table. Bloomberg scoop yesterday uh, saying that uh, she would actually cut business rates, which have been so unpopular with businesses, it would kill two birds with one stone by allowing businesses more room to pay their energy bills this winter. Okay, Lizzie, thank you so much for the update. That's our very own Lizzie Burden. Now coming up, Perno Ricard CEO, Alexandre Ricard, on the results at the French drinks maker. We'll have that interview for you next. This is Bloomberg.
everybody want to be a consultant? And what are all these consultants doing? Well, David, I think that we actually defy the label consultant because sometimes consultant seems to imply that we only give advice. And when you look at what Accenture does, we're really different than the traditional version of a consultant. We're really about relevance and results. And that's what is uh, driving our business. What about a consulting project? In my example, I'm the CEO. I have a problem. I call you up. I say, solve my problem or give me a solution. We don't operate as big companies permanently in crisis mode. And so when you think about like how long does it solve things, a lot of it starts with, you know, the company being willing to set aggressive goals. And so what we are trying to do now is work with our clients to work differently and to work faster. Bloomberg has enhanced search on the terminal to deliver what you need when you need it. Now, you can simply type phrases in everyday English in the command line. Compare financials. Find people. Analyze markets. You can enter phrases or ask questions. What do you want to know today? Ask a question or visit SearchGo to find answers now. Economics, finance, politics. This is Bloomberg Surveillance Early Edition. I'm Danny Berger in London. Now, French distiller Pernod Ricard has reported full year revenue that was at a record as consumers drank more scotch coming out of the pandemic. The makers of alcohols, including Absolute Vodka, also signaled further price hikes in the U.S. and other key markets. Well, we're joined now by Pernod Ricard CEO, Alexandra Ricard. Alexandra, thank you so much for joining us this morning. I mean, look, it, it, huge numbers here, another, another full year of a record, especially significant considering that in places like Europe, in Asia, and even in the U.S. to some extent, we're heading into a cycle of a downturn. Given the results you've seen, how sustainable is the level of consumer spending if we are going into a more sustained downturn? Listen, uh, what we're seeing so far, uh, and this is uh, a post-COVID uh, human behavior, which is amazing, is it, 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 there is definitely a newfound appreciation for conviviality, for celebration, for togetherness. And uh, I'm sure you've witnessed it over summer uh, on terraces that were full, uh, hotels uh, that were operating as well, uh, quite full, uh, tourism, uh, vacation. Uh, so, so far, uh, so good. And, and we've had really record uh, results with our net sales growing by 21%. We hadn't seen this in over 30 years and our profits growing uh, by 25%. And this is really broad-based. I mean, coming from all regions, America's up double-digit 12%, Asia, rest of the world up 19%, and Europe as well up uh, 19%. So that's the demand side. It's clearly there. But what about the supply side of things? What is the most difficult for you to source now, whether it be materials, whether it be labor, or just the cost of keeping the lights on? No, there is no doubt that uh, supply chain uh, has been disrupted. It has somewhat improved a little bit, but it's still being uh, disrupted. Uh, that's number one. Number two. Obviously, and that's no news for, for anyone right now, but there's, uh, there's inflation. Uh, we have increased our prices uh, basically everywhere, uh, on average, mid-single digit. And you should expect us to continue to increase prices as we enter in our new fiscal year to offset, uh, of course, uh, inflation. Do you think that'll still be in the mid-single digit figures, the price increases going forward? Yeah, that, that's, that's basically a, a broad average. Uh, it will vary from one market to another. It will vary from one brand to another. Uh, but clearly, uh, our, uh, our price increase strategy is designed uh, to offset inflation, uh, of course. And uh, we're investing behind our brands and brand equity to make sure uh, that the demand uh, stays there for, for the brands. Are, are there any other levers which you're able to push besides pushing along prices? For example, are you looking at cost cuts, uh, anything of that regard, slowing hiring as well to help keep some of those measures and keep margins in line? 
Well, that's a great question. There are absolutely many, many uh, levels that we can activate and that we do activate. Uh, obviously, the, uh, the first uh, and foremost one is pricing, but then you also have promotional intensity, promotional depth, promotional uh, frequency. Uh, then you also have uh, uh, your mix. Uh, you have your innovation strategy, where you, you, you push new innovations at higher price points that are more margin accretive. And then you have Cox. And on the, the cost mm -hmm. side, uh, we have a, a number of operational efficiency initiatives uh, to protect as well uh, our, our margin. Alexandra, one thing that, that really struck me as fascinating in this reporting, reporting season, we heard from Fever Tree saying that they're having a difficult time sourcing glass, among other things. Obviously, glass, a very important thing for your business. How acute are those pressures? Are, are we going to see a situation where you, know, you have to look beyond the usual materials you're using? Well, listen, uh, as I mentioned, supply chain is somewhat disrupted. Now we're, we're a big uh, glass uh, purchaser. What we are seeing on the glass front is obviously a lot of inflation, which we're covering through uh, the initiatives I, I mentioned earlier. And uh, we foresee these uh, disruptions to continue, uh, at least for the foreseeable future, i.e. The, the coming months, of course. What about when it comes to your sales outlook in Asia? We just learned this morning, at least morning European time, that a, a new city in China was locked down, locking down of 21 million people. The reopening story, it seems still far away for Asia. What does that mean for your outlook? Listen, what it does mean is, is a continued uh, disruption uh, of, of the trade with uh, goes and no goes, with stop and goes, like we've witnessed over the last 12 months. Uh, so far, as we're moving into mid-autumn festival period, and mid-autumn festival is, is next, next week, uh, the trade uh, is quite confident, and so our, our sell-in numbers are, are, uh, are quite strong. And we'll see how the sell-out uh, takes place in, in the coming weeks. Uh, but so far, so good. What we've seen is easing of restrictions uh, starting uh, the month of June, and uh, we, our, our growth has resumed in June after two difficult months because of uh, increased restrictions. So we'll see how things go, but um, uh, there's stop and go. And uh, what's interesting to see is that as soon as the trade reopens, uh, people enjoy going back out again. Hmm. Certainly true. We've seen that, as you said, the conviviality still uh, alive and well in uh, post-lockdown in other regions. I do just want to end it on the energy concerns in Europe. If we're going into a period where costs are going to continue to rise, uh, perhaps demand rationing when it comes to industry, are you doing anything or have you been hedging energy costs? Yeah, maybe two things on that front. First of all, from a, a more long-term strategic perspective, we have a, a clear sustainability and responsibility strategic roadmap where uh, energy saving, energy efficiency is, is core to that roadmap. So these are initiatives we already started work on, on a, a number of years ago, with renewable e in energy uh, being uh, first and foremost. And second, the more short-term uh, issues. And uh, as a, a European company, a, a citizen uh, of, of Europe, uh, we're obviously going to do our bit in terms of uh, savings uh, over the winter, which is uh, perfectly fine with us. All right, Alexandra, thank you so much for joining us this morning. Alexandra Ricard, CEO of Pernod Ricard, thanks so much. This is Bloomberg.
China's military power has been growing at an incredible speed over the last 20 years. A strong country must have a strong military, as only then can it guarantee the security of the nation. In terms of sphere of influence, we absolutely know that China wants to be dominant in Asia. So there is a target to get to that point, to be a military that is a peer to the greatest militaries in the world by 2035. The competition for influence is a global one. And through a multi-decade trajectory fueled by planning, money, and pragmatism, China is building a military that allows it to shape the 21st century just as the U.S. shaped the 20th. at the Fed are on Bloomberg. I have a baseline case going into September that is 50 basis points. That's where I've been since the last meeting. But I have an open mind about whether okay. 75 is going to be necessary. 50, 75 doesn't just depend on a data point, even an important one like the CPI. I like to say that we're data dependent. We're not data point dependent. Nobody covers the Fed like Bloomberg, your global business authority market that over the past few weeks has made it clear it wants to go higher. It got a little spooked by the idea that geopolitical potentials are rising. My current view is that it will be necessary, necessary to move the Fed funds rate up to somewhat above 4% by early next year and hold it there. I do not anticipate the Fed cutting the Fed funds rate target next year. The Fed's already a master there on the need for higher rates. And that continued hawkish endorsement of Jay Powell's message is something that has continued to weigh on risk assets and send yields higher. Now, two-year yields may be taking a bit of a pause uh, from the extremes of the upward mark we've seen still uh, at the highest since 2007. Stocks, likewise, are falling this morning, too. Bears doubling down. Jeremy Grantham says the super bubble has yet to burst. All of that means everyone's flocking to the dollar. We're also nearing 140 on yen. We are, though, seeing that gas continue to tumble for a fourth day. It's now down about 33% from the peak of what we saw. Yes, there's more stockpiling. Uh, demand for fuel has also slumped 12% on the year in August, according to City. Von der Leyen is also set to outline a plan for power in her September 14th speech. Well, Bloomberg Surveillance Early Edition continues in the next hour. This is Bloomberg. name a couple of, of your babies. I don't know if I'm asking you to choose amongst your children, but you know, some of the most recognizable buildings by you, of course, the Millennium Bridge, London City Hall, the Reichstag, and uh, the Great Court British Museum. What was your favorite project to do? The Reichstag does stand out because, first of all, it's an energy manifesto. So, um, so it transformed something that was dependent on fossil fuels. It uses all the technology to produce something which, uh, which is essentially carbon neutral. And as a public building, uh, that's a statement. It's a symbol of a city. It's a symbol of a nation. It incorporates um, works of art. It's recycling an existing building, which, as I 
mentioned earlier is the ultimate in, in sustainability. If you can, uh, if you can give a new life to a building, it, it also creates public space at the roof level. It uh, is the most visited parliament in the world, so it puts the the public above the politicians who are answerable to them. And that, of course, was made possible by the politicians. So it's, um, it's a demonstration of democracy in action. Access the financial world on demand. Hear from leading economists, policymakers, and industry experts via live and on-demand webinars only from Bloomberg. Start exploring to see what's moving the markets. Visit Bloomberg.com webinars. isn't it just how sensitive the markets are to any commentary about trade we did see some pressure on the yuan we did see some pressure on the futures that is now being reversed There's a lot of different potential outcomes as we head into the fall. I think there are huge disparities still out there. Overall, we're still neutral on equities. I wouldn't be surprised if equity markets go down a bit further from here. Everybody's really trading on, on all these different data points, so we expect uh, a lot of volatility ahead in equity markets. This is Bloomberg Surveillance Early Edition with Anna Edwards, Matt Miller, and Kaylee Lines. It is 10 a.m. in London, 5 a.m. in New York, 5 p.m. in Hong Kong. Our top stories today. China ramps up COVID-0. 21 million people in the city of Chengdu will be locked down in a fight to contain a coronavirus outbreak. Warnings of a super bubble in the stock market that has yet to burst. Famed investor Jeremy Grantham says overvalued equities, bonds and housing will collide with high rates and inflation. And British households brace themselves. A new report says they're in for the biggest squeeze on living standards in a century. Welcome to Bloomberg Surveillance Early Edition. I'm Tom McKenzie in London with Matt Miller and Kriti Gupta in New York. Anna Edwards and Kelly Lines are off today. Kriti then working through these comments around a market bubble and the direction for the S&P. You know what's interesting, Tom, is at the end of the day, it really does come down to the COVID story, at least in the Asian session. The idea that a lot of this risk-off sentiment that you're seeing comes from that COVID lockdown. Of course, in China, think about it, another mega city being shut down, which also, by the way, uh, will have implications for those supply chain issues. Once again, uh, a little bit of a deja vu situation. You can see how that's impacting Asian assets. No surprise here, down 1.9% across the region. If you actually zoom in uh, to the Nikkei specifically, down 1.5%. So once again, that tech-centric focus getting hit, does that uh, really continue on into the U.S. session is going to be the question. And as, of course, you see that China uh, lockdown situation, of course, you're going to see a little bit of a correlation with copper prices also taking it on the chin down to the tune about 2%. I have to say, though, once again, I've been saying this all week. The currency story is the one that's catching my eye here. All week. All week. saying it all year. All year, but a little extra this week. Uh, and this currency story is crucial, at least this time of when, when the Japanese yen hitting new weakness, now the weakest, going all the way back to 1998, a 24-year low. And I guess the question, Matt, is how low can it go? Yeah, and for the record, I do not disagree with you. Obviously, the currency story is massive. The dollar is approaching a record high. V Valerie Sarasov Willow in London uh, points out that the interday level to beat is 1304. Right now, the Bloomberg dollar index at 1297 and climbing. So we're getting close to that level once again. You can see S&P futures are down. It's not just the Asia lockdowns, though that didn't help. It's the NVIDIA news about new export rules to China that really hit that stock in the entire tech sector hard after hours yesterday that are going to hurt the market as we open today. Take a look at crude right now, down below $90 for Texas Intermediate, $87.68 um, as 
really the market grapples with the idea of slower growth. Yes, supply may be tight. There's not a lot of spare capacity um, in OPEC uh, or, or in the US uh, for that matter, but demand is going to be even worse. Bitcoin right now down under 20,000 as well at 19,932, moving obviously with risk assets and on concern of continued higher rates after what we heard from Loretta Mester yesterday. Tom, what's Europe look like this morning? Uh, yeah, Matt, and just on our oil story, for the context, Chengdu, population 21 million, so almost the same population of Australia, the same population as the Netherlands being locked Very down. Again, to that impact in terms of the demand. Here across Europe, you're heading for five straight days uh, of losses, some pretty heavy selling uh, across the benchmark. You can see in here in the UK down 1.4%, over in France down 1.5%, and losses in Germany of 1.4%. Let's switch it on, see how things then are playing out across these indexes. And you talk about the currencies, I want to match your yen with sterling, Critty, I up you because sterling down five and a half percent in the month of August. That is the worst month since Brexit. And despite that's despite the fact that yields at the front end in terms of gilts, two year yields up around 130 basis points for the month. The biggest jump you've seen in yields since about 1992. Despite that, the pound still being pummeled. And we're looking at that again uh, today. 116 on the pound, a loss of a tenth of a percent. And yields 308 now. That is a jump in terms of yields up six basis points. The sell-off continues. Again, across the benchmark, losses of one and a half percent. And one corporate story to bring to your attention. This is Reckitt Bank. It's a surprise in terms of the CEO stepping down after pretty successfully restructuring this business. They now have an interim CEO the market's not liking that down a little over four percent pretty uh, certainly a lot to digest really interesting on the macro and the micro front especially as all eyes on payrolls this week let's look a look at what's ahead today u.s economic releases include manufacturing and auto sales data for august you also have rafael bostic of the atlanta fed due to speak and president biden set to deliver a prime time address in philadelphia on what the white house calls quote the continued battle for the soul of the nation matt all right, so we'll follow all of that very closely. But the big news, as you pointed out at the top, um, in markets is China. The city of Chengdu is locking down its 21 million residents. It's a huge move, obviously, in the vast western region of the country that had so far been largely untouched by the coronavirus pandemic. John Liu, Bloomberg's executive editor for Greater China, joins us now from Beijing. So they are sticking with COVID zero and telling people you can't leave the house unless you want to go get groceries once a day. That's right, Matt. Uh, 21 million people, as you said, locked down indefinitely. We do not have an end date for that lockdown. I think that is what people are watching. Uh, it could go one of two ways. It could go something like Shanghai, which was locked down for two months. We've had other cities who've locked down for a few days and then come out of that lockdown. And so uh, really looking forward to whether or not this action by the authorities there in Chengdu stops the outbreak there. If it does, then maybe this is short-lived and a blip. If it doesn't, it could cause real uh, pronounced pain for the economy. Uh, and John, on the geopolitics, we're hearing that Taiwan and Taiwanese uh, military have shot down a drone that apparently came over from the mainland, from China, across to one of the islands uh, that is, of course, controlled by Taiwan. How dangerous is this moment? What do you read into this? And have we heard anything from officials in Beijing in response? So the, the, uh, for the last couple of days, there have been civilian drones being flown from uh, the mainland over to uh, some of the outlying islands under Taiwan's control. It's, these islands are very close to the mainland, so well within the range of a civilian drone. Uh, obviously, uh, this is less severe than if it was a military aircraft of some sort that, that was shot down, uh, but still it speaks to how tense the situation is, uh, how on edge everybody is about any interaction between the two sides at this moment. John, thanks very much. John Liu is uh, uh, Bloomberg's managing editor for Greater China out of Beijing. I just want to point out we're getting headlines across from Hong Kong as well that officials there are targeting the end to the hotel quarantine rules in November. So still two months from now, and it's only a target, but uh, that news at least goes in the other direction. Now let's get to a big warning from a big bear. Investor Jeremy Grantham says the stock's super bubble that he warned about previously has yet to pop. The GMO co-founder sees more trouble ahead due to what he calls a dangerous mix of overvalued equities, bonds, and housing. Bloomberg's Danny Berger joins us now. So Danny, it's not surprising that uh, Jeremy Grantham is bearish, but people always find it very interesting. 
Yeah, I mean, look, definitely a perma bear. It does feel like in this current environment, Matt, though, the bears are the loudest in the room, if, if not the most plentiful. I, I have to read a portion of what he said because it's almost Shakespearean. He said, prepare for an epic finale. If history repeats, the play will once again be a tragedy. We must hope this time for a minor one. So a lot of drama injected in here. But I think the most interesting thing, or among the most interesting thing about Grantham's call that a super bubble hasn't deflated yet is that it's not necessarily about the Fed. Look, we've seen equity markets have this major reprice as that Powell pivot gets priced out. But it's not interest rates that Graham is worried about. It is earnings. It is multiple compression. It is margins taking a hit. That is something that perhaps the market has yet to grapple with. So his original call was down 50% from the peak. At the worst of the June lows, we got to about 25%. It's not just him. It's Mike Wilson from Morgan Stanley. And, and Matt, he's a perma bear too. That's also worth pointing out. But he also thinks we're going to retest those June lows. And he also says it's because of earnings. So right now we're trying to digest the Fed. Has the second shoe dropped? EPS for EPS has dropped by about 2.5% from the peak, Tom, which does suggest that if margins are going to deteriorate, there's some pricing in left to do there. OK, the drama in the markets being articulated by Jeremy Grantham. Uh, as you say, Danny Berger, thank you very much indeed. Plenty of drama here in the UK as well as we weigh up the cost of living crisis. It just gets worse, uh, it seems, on a daily basis. A new report saying the UK households are set for the biggest squeeze on living standards in a century. The Resolution Foundation warned of a 10% fall in real disposable incomes over two years unless there is a support package of tens of billions of pounds. Joining us now for more is Bloomberg's Lizzie Burden. Lizzie, at this Resolution Foundation report, it is dire, to say the least. Dire, to say the least, and it underscores the challenge that awaits whoever is the next Prime Minister. The Resolution Foundation says that three million people more are going to be in absolute poverty because of this. Households are going to be £3,000 less well off, and that's despite the £30 billion worth of support that we've already had from the government since March. So we had the Chief Economist of the Resolution Foundation, Mike Brewer, on Bloomberg Radio earlier. He called for this extra support from the government, but of course we know that the front runner to be the next Prime Minister, Liz Truss, is against what she calls handouts. So uh, we also had, remember, uh, uh, the deputy, former Deputy BOE Governor Charlie Bean on Bloomberg TV oh. saying that the tax cuts Liz Truss wants uh, aren't targeted enough at the needy. So yes, it's a very dire situation if you're one of the poorest households in Britain who's most exposed to this cost of living crisis. I thought also the Charlie Bean interview was absolutely brilliant. Highly recommend people go back and look at it. Listen, everyone's talking about Liz Truss as if she is the new PM. Um, give us an update for those of us who don't live in Great Britain. What's, what's the deal? What's the schedule? When do we know for, for certain? All the polls are saying that it's likely to be Liz Truss. Uh, we're going to find out on Monday. I'll be at Downing Street with all the news. Uh, but we had more hustings in London yesterday, and Liz Truss not only said that she would do tax cuts, but she ruled out tax rises. And that's despite this Bloomberg scoop, which revealed Treasury analysis, showing that if the windfall tax were continued, it would generate tens of billions of pounds that could help people with their energy bills because of all these excess profits from the energy companies. But Truss has ruled that out, and we have another Bloomberg scoop, in fact, which says that she would cut business rates, and that would kill two birds with one stone, because, of course, businesses here have been so against these commercial property taxes, but it would also help them with their energy bills. Bloomberg's Lizzie Murden on all things Europe, and specifically the UK. It's a lot to digest. Well, speaking of uh, all things going on across the Atlantic, we do have some breaking news here. A headline coming uh, from Lufthansa here saying that they are going to cancel almost all Frankfurt and Munich flights that coming uh, on Friday. So once again, you are starting to see a lot of the energy crunch, that travel crunch specifically hitting those flights. We'll bring you keep, more keep, updates. Keep in mind, keep, can, I'm sorry to interrupt. Keep in mind, Trudy, how important this is as a hub, because Lufthansa is one of the big European airlines and almost all of its flights go through Frankfurt, one of the biggest airports in Europe. So it's huge news um, for the business community and for vacation travelers. Well, I was going to say time. for vacation travelers, it feels yeah. like everyone is in Europe right now. And of course, as you mentioned, while really flying through that hub, we will, of course, will bring you all the updates there. In the meantime, let's bring it back to Washington here. Bloomberg sources say federal prosecutors are likely to wait until after the November midterm elections to announce any charges against Donald Trump. This comes okay. after the U.S. Justice Department said White House records held in a storage room at the former president's Florida home may have been concealed or removed before a June FBI search. Jack Fitzpatrick, our resident Bloomberg government reporter, has the latest from Washington. Jack, walk us through it. 
Yeah, so the news today, uh, according to people familiar with the process, is that the Justice Department knows they're not going to announce charges uh, if they get to that point before the midterm elections in November. They have guidance, uh, a policy that they have inconsistently followed in recent years, that they're not supposed to take that kind of step uh, and, and reveal information about the investigations that are being opened, charges that are being brought that are politically sensitive within 60 days before an election. Like Comey Clinton. Uh, yes, Comey Clinton. Uh, and also the announcement by Bill Barr uh, leading up to 2020 that they may open high-profile voter fraud investigations leading up to the uh, to the the election. Uh, that's the kind of thing that's not really supposed to happen within 60 days. 60 days before the election is just September 10th. Uh, they're obviously not going to finish this uh, by then, and they actually may not get to the point of deciding who to charge or what charges they might want to bring by November. Uh, but at least for now, they're making clear that uh, it, the the end road of this and the big question of whether the former president would be charged with crimes is not something that's going to be answered before the election, uh, and part of that is a policy that's meant to avoid having a, a huge effect on the election itself. Hey, Jack, a Democrat won a special election in Alaska to replace the single, their single um, representative, and that sets up a fight with Sarah Palin, right? Uh, it, it was round one of the fight with Sarah Palin. There's going to be a rematch. Uh, because Don Young, the longtime representative, uh, died earlier this year, they had a special election that took a while to schedule. So they're, they're running again in November. But for now, Democrats have one more seat, a little more breathing room for upcoming votes on things like to fund the government and that kind of thing. Uh, but it's a, it's a notable victory for a Democrat, not just because a Democrat won in Alaska, but won. This was somebody who campaigned pretty specifically uh, and aggressively pushing back on the Supreme Court decision to strike down Roe v. Wade. Uh, and also, this is ranked choice voting. They just installed that new system in Alaska. Sarah Palin, obviously a very high-profile Republican with a following. Uh, she was one of two Republicans. Nick Begich, uh, the other Republican, only about half of his supporters gave their second choice to Palin. Uh, the rest either supported the Democrat uh, or did not choose to use Use it. So it's an interesting case study in how this newer system that's uh, being put in place in some states plays out, and in this case, uh, helped Democrats in a, an unlikely state like Alaska. Jack Fitzpatrick of Bloomberg Government, we thank you as always. Waking up early this morning to give us all things Washington. Let's take a quick look at some of the stocks moving in pre-market trading in the United States. I want to start with NVIDIA, the big heavyweight here, the chip heavyweight, I might add, declining on a warning that a Chinese restriction, or I say a restriction to China, essentially the law governing the exports of artificial intelligence to China, well, that's going to be limited. Well, now the NVIDIA is saying, well, it's going to hurt sales. It's going to hurt their bottom line in a massive way. So you can see that news actually dropping on the shares about 5%. The question is what will the translation be to the broader S&P 500? Once again, I mentioned it is a massive heavyweight in the S&P 500, so we are, of course, going to keep an eye on that, as well as the ripple effect throughout all the chip stocks here. Broadcom, remember, is reporting after the bell, so there is a massive chip story to be had. We, of course, will keep you apprised of it throughout the day on Bloomberg Television. My second mover this morning is going to be 3M. We've been talking about the job cuts all week, this story for Snapchat. We've also talked about it in big tech. We've got payrolls tomorrow. Well, now it's hitting the industrials as well. 3M planning to eliminate jobs in a broader cost-cutting push. Right now, it seems like the stock is unmoved. It was moving earlier in the session, so certainly a name to keep your eye on. And lastly, we'll go back to the retail favorite, Bed Bath & Beyond, unveiling a turnaround plan that envisions new financing, sweeping store closings, and the sale of as many as 12 million shares of stock. On the news yesterday, of course, the stock dropping some 27% in the session. This morning, the hangover continues down about 5%, Tom. Okay, the Bed Bath & Beyond story is the story that keeps on giving, isn't it? Across these markets, thank you very much indeed. Coming up, uh, we're going to talk uh, further about how to position across these markets as we weigh up these calls around bubble risks and further downside. Esti Dweck, Flowbank CIO, is with us. And Russia's 24-hour English language news channel. It may be banned in the US. It's already been banned uh, in the EU, at least parts of the EU, the UK as well. But it's turning its focus uh, to a new audience. Read more of today's Big Take story on Bloomberg.com or by typing in NI Big Take into your terminal. This is Bloomberg.
past two decades, China has built large infrastructure projects in almost every country in Africa. African governments themselves said we are tired of aid and charity. We want to do trade, we want to be treated like partners. The Chinese came along and said, great, we don't do aid and charity, we want to do business with you. Global Gateway will mobilize 300 billion euros till 2027. Now the US and Europe are answering back with their own infrastructure initiatives to counter China, but African experts are skeptical. China has been that guy around the corner with, you know, a bouquet of flowers to Africa, the US, you know, Europe and the UK of time and time again say, be careful of the flowers you see out of the window, they have thorns on them. the financial world on demand. Hear from leading economists, policymakers, and industry experts via live and on-demand webinars only from Bloomberg. Start exploring to see what's moving the markets. Visit Bloomberg.com webinars. Bloomberg Surveillance Early Edition. I'm Matt Miller with Kriti Gupta in New York and Tom McKenzie in London. We are simulcast on radio and television. Nonetheless, I'm going to show you a chart here that I think is important. I'm going to show those of you watching. Those of you listening can imagine uh, what it looks like. We see financing costs jumping, and that's illustrated on this chart just by two-year uh, yields rising. On the other hand, we see the pound dropping. In fact, I'm pretty sure it was uh, one of the worst months in recent memory since Brexit, actually, for the UK pound versus the dollar for the cable rate. So that puts UK companies in a very difficult position. Joining us to talk about that is Irena Garcia Perez, a Bloomberg distressed debt reporter. So Irena, how are we see this playing out? How are we seeing this play out? So we see investors having a lot of question marks and doubts about um, what's to come for the UK economy. It's, of course, a gloomy outlook, but how bad inflation is going to get, um, what the Bank of England is going to do about it, and also, although they are pricing in um, an interest rate hike, of course, but it's also about what the next government is going to do to support um, the economy. Hey, Randy, what is the read across, if there is a read across, or at least what is the situation in, in the US when it comes to those corporate debt, the stress, the pressure, as we readjust to this more hawkish Fed? Are we expecting to see a blowout in yields? So it is higher. Um, for, for corporate uh, borrowing, it is getting more expensive, but yeah. it's still it's coming back to June levels, and it still has some room to go to 2020 COVID levels. So it's getting worse, and it's getting more expensive, but not as bad as um, in Europe, in relative terms. Yeah, and of course, the UK has its own idiosyncrasies as well. Irene Garcia Perez, thank you very much uh, indeed on what is happening across the corporate bond space. For more market analysis, check out MLive. Go on your terminal. Plenty more coming up. Stay with us. This is Bloomberg. I think Jay Powell said things that were indefensible. Need to catch up? This is Bloomberg Wall Street Week. I'm David Weston. 
We've got the information and insights. We think that's the next secular shift. From businesses most influential and instrumental. Yes, it's about renewables. It's a challenging dynamic. This is a level of uncertainty that we haven't had to deal with. Bloomberg Wall Street Week, live Friday with replays all weekend on Bloomberg Television and Radio. Is it possible the industry is in an arms race that will lead to spending itself into an oversupply? I mean, that has happened before. You know, we, we, we've looked at this very carefully. And, you know, the digitization of everything. Tell me what aspect of your life, Emily, isn't becoming more digital? Well, I'm right. trying to prevent that, but yes, <laughs> I think it's happening. <laughs> you know, and COVID has accelerated that. The industry cost $500 billion last year, the semiconductor industry overall, and estimates are a trillion dollars, a doubling by the end of the decade uh, at that point. I believe those estimates. It's not that there's not going to be some blips and turns on the way, and the majority of that is driven by leadership process technology, of which only three companies can satisfy that need. Markets count down in Europe from the financial centers of the world. Bloomberg Markets European Close with Guy Johnson in London and Alex Steele in New York. Real-time numbers, real-time analysis. Weekdays. Friday. Why is Elon Musk said no to the car factory? It's still in discussion. Let's see later the final result. Do you think that by bringing people together, that is a way to solve conflict? There must be communication, even if it doesn't necessarily resolve the problem. It is better to have dialogue than to have open conflict. This is a conversation with President Jokowi of Indonesia. Only on Bloomberg. Keeping you up to date with news from around the world, here is the first word. In California, blackouts have been averted so far in the midst of a heat wave that could threaten the supply of electricity through next Monday. The state called off its power grid emergency as night fell and it got cooler. The temps reached triple digits in much of the state yesterday. Russia is holding major military exercises with China and India. It's seen as Vladimir Putin's way of pushing back against attempts by the U.S. and its allies to isolate him uh, and his move in the invasion of Ukraine. More than 50,000 troops, 140 aircraft, and 60 ships are taking part in the war games in Russia's Far East. And Lufthansa says it will cancel almost all flights to and from its Frankfurt and Munich hubs on Friday. That comes after the German Airlines Pilot Union called for a one-day strike. About 800 flights will be affected in total. Coming up, Esti Dweck, the CIO at Flowbank, joins us. This is Bloomberg. The way venture firms work is you commit capital, let's say over a five-year investment period, something like that. Yeah, yeah, exactly. Right. And then the fund is typically lasts maybe 10 years or so. 15. Well, these days longer, so often 15. Often the tail extends out to 20 years because uh, okay. these companies take long, a long time to develop. And somebody that invests in a venture fund today uh, should be trying to get rates of return of 
20%, would you say, or more? You know, top end venture is sort of 3x net of fees. Um, you know, but you, you ideally you're hoping for more than that. You're hoping for 5x or more. Um, you know, you, you're illiquid the entire time, right? So you, you, you would you'd hope to get paid for the illiquidity. And today, so yeah, maybe 20 to 40% if, if, if things go well is sort of baseline. Let's take it another subject. Let's suppose somebody says, I don't want to invest in Andreessen Horowitz. I want to be Mark Andreessen. How does somebody become a venture capitalist? What are the skill sets for good venture capitalists? It is high degree of intelligence, hard work, a lot of luck, uh, dress the right part, don't wear a tie. What, what are the things that make one a good venture capitalist? So the, super, the, the highly successful VCs historically are very idiosyncratic. Um, you have people from very different backgrounds. Mike Morris is a former newspaper reporter. John Doerr is a former chip salesman. Um, you've got people with very different, Mitch and Breyer has more of this kind of blue chip investment background. Uh, you have people with very different backgrounds and experiences. And so I, I think it's, it's some set of skills and some set of knowledge, and then it's, there, there seems to be a taste component to it that's, that's really hard to measure and, and really hard to predict. Today's CFOs are reshaping the C-suite, positioning companies to meet the next generation of challenges, breaking out of traditional roles. One of the most important things is looking around the corner. Look for Chief Future Officer on Bloomberg. This is Bloomberg Surveillance Early Edition. Here's what you need to know. China ramps up COVID zero. 21 million people in the city of Chengdu will be locked down in a fight to contain a coronavirus outbreak. Warnings of a super bubble in the stock market that is yet to burst. Famed investor Jeremy Grantham says overvalued equities, bonds and housing will collide with high rates and inflation. And British households brace themselves. A new report says they're in for the biggest squeeze on living standards in a century. Welcome to Bloomberg Surveillance Early Edition. I'm Tom McKenzie in London with Matt Miller and Kriti Gupta in New York. Anna Edwards and Kayleigh Lyons are off today. Matt, you're checking in on U.S. markets. Here in Europe, the bloodletting continues. Yeah, and I have to say the inflation warnings uh, out of the U.K. are dire. I mean, um, the yeah. worst inflation, the worst crunch on living standards since the end of World War II will be interest uh, World War I will be interesting to see how uh, Liz Truss deals with it if she indeed gets that seat. Take a look at futures here. We're down really on the Chengdu lockdown. Um, it's a huge amount of people. It's a huge drop in demand, especially if it's extended to the any kind of um, length like we saw in Shanghai. Um, and we're also looking at a high in the dollar or getting closer to a high in the dollar. Actually, the intraday level is 1304, spot 55, but we're pretty close at 12. Um, 28, and you can really see that effect in the strength of the dollar, especially if we're talking about Europe, over the euro or over the pound. NYMEX crude coming down on concern about a drop in demand under $90 a barrel, way under now at uh, 87.98. And Bitcoin also coming down um, in uh, 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 as it is highly correlated with risk assets, in sympathy with risk, risk assets at 19,894. Critty, what do you see in terms of the pre-market movers? Because we got that big uh, dire news from Nvidia yesterday. We did, and it's really having a major effect on the share price and in probably the entire sector, not to mention the entire benchmark. Of course, we know NVIDIA is that massive heavyweight. Declining on that warning, essentially that some that restriction that US, uh, the US government has put on the chip sector broadly, any artificial intelligence, the exports to China, well, there are going to be some limitations on this. NVIDIA is saying it's going to hurt their bottom line. So those shares down to the tune about 5.6% this morning. And the job losses, Matt, they continue to the industrial sector. We've talked about it in SNAP. We've talked about it in Silicon Valley in big tech. Well, now 3M planning to eliminate jobs in a broader cost-cutting push. This is something that's going to start uh, picking up steam as we go throughout the week. Right now, it's not weighing on shares, but it was moving them earlier in the session, so we are going to keep an eye on those names. And lastly, a retail favorite, Bed Bath & Beyond, Tom, unveiling a turnaround plan that envisions new financing, sweeping store closings, and get this, the sale of as many as 12 million shares of the stock. We know liquidity has been a major issue, and apparently those stock sales are the way to address them. Those shares down 5 I just love how even globally we zero in on this stock, Bed Bath & Beyond, a stock that, frankly, outside of the U.S., probably most of us had never heard of up until about 12 months ago or Dude, so. Dude, have you seen Thank Old you. School? 
No, I've missed that on old school. Tom well, clearly doesn't go towel shopping. I highly shopping. recommend watching it. They may have to go That's to Bed Bath & Beyond. Wrong. It could be a pretty busy Saturday. Uh, here, here, here in Europe, markets continue. Setting themselves up for five straight days of losses now. 1.6% across the benchmark is the loss that you're looking at. Yes, I have a bit of a UK bias today because the pound, again, is being hit. Of course, Matt was talking about the strength of the US dollar. That, of course, is a factor. And then you have the idiosyncratic pressures within the UK as well. 115 below 116, a loss of two tenths of a percent in the session today. That is despite the fact that gilts continue to rise higher, up five basis points in the session. The sell-off in terms of the front end, particularly here in the UK, pronounced. 130 basis points. That was a move higher in yields just the month of August alone. The biggest jump you've seen since 1992. And a loss, by the way, in the pound of 5.5% in August. The biggest drop since Brexit. One corporate story to bring to your attention is Reckitt Benkis. So it's a maker of consumer goods here in the UK. Down 4.5%. The CEO leaving unexpectedly. An interim executive taking over for the moment. Investors not liking the news. Down almost 4.5%. And, and some big names there as well for US consumers. They make... Calgon, they mm. make Lysol, right? They make Durex, they make Clearasil. Yep. I mean, it's a huge uh, company that a lot of Americans have not heard of. So good to keep an eye on that. Joining us now is SD Dweck, Flowbank CIO, to talk about what we can expect really on both sides of the Atlantic. SD, obviously, inflation is huge here. And, you know, I had a bet with Critty that headline CPI had peaked in the US. And I think I've won that bet. But what does it look like in Europe? Well, I would agree with you on the U.S. front, but I would also agree with you that for Europe and the U.K., we are not there yet. Uh, we saw European inflation come in hot yesterday. It doesn't seem like it's the peak when you look at what electricity and gas prices have been doing. Um, we had a couple of good days earlier in the week because German storage levels were better than expected, but we're not even you know, close to winter yet, and those prices are still going up. So a big, big challenge for Europe and not much better, actually probably even worse uh, for the UK. So Esty, the reason that Matt won the bet was he said that it was really all commodities driven. Uh, and then as you saw some of the commodity prices come down, that was what was uh, basically the main driver of inflation. My argument was it was rent, it was the other cost of living pressures. And then he said he wanted to go to Dairy Queen to collect on the bet. Now he's on a diet and now he can't collect. So I really think I came out the winner here. But Esty, let's go to that point of what's actually driving the story. Because of course we know commodities has been in the driver's seat, but I'm curious about the other costs here, the rent, uh, the food cost, for example, your take? So you certainly have the goods inflation coming down, and the commodity aspect was huge at the beginning of the year, and that helps. Rent, I think, will probably come down, but slower uh, and maybe not as soon as some of these other prices. And the services area does tend to be a little stickier, so we have to keep an eye on that. But uh, at, the, at the start of the show, you were talking about some of these uh, job cuts that we're going to see, a bit less investments. We'll see what the non-farm payrolls come out as tomorrow. But uh, it does feel that you have a number of different disinflationary signals in the U.S. that are coming through and that inflation will gradually come down, not just because of commodity prices. And we can't really say that for Europe. Uh, Esty, how much of that then is informing this, this call from you? The outlook for risk assets has improved. Uh, wh what are you seeing that Mike Wilson, Jeremy Grantham and others are not at this point? Well, the truth is there's a lot of it is about this disinflation that should come through. The other aspect is that, yes, a lot of people put this sort of expectation of a Fed pivot uh, as the reason for the rally over the summer. But the rally started before uh, the CPI number was a bit better, before the July FOMC minutes. So it, it started really end of June. We had quite a bit of breath to the rally. Sentiment is still extremely negative, and you've just quoted a number of reasons why, but short positions have increased. Cash levels are still elevated. People are, were not happy with the summer's rally. Now, is this week a return to those lows? I think the June lows will hold. Are we gonna have a straight line up? Clearly not, and I don't think we should expect that into the end of the year either. But we're already pricing in quite a bit of tightening. The bond market hasn't moved that much, at least in terms of rate hike expectations. Yes, a bit more of the 75 for September, but it was really a wash between 50 and 75 anyway, and then a few more hikes. What's changed is the Fed is going to stay higher for longer, so those 2023 expectations need to change. But how bad does the news need to be and need to come out? 
for us to reprice those June lows and break the, through those. And I think that bar is relatively high. Okay, so the view is that the June lows hold. Where does that take you then, Esty, in terms of sector allocation? Well, we saw uh, tech suffer in the last week, of course, because of those central bank hiking expectations. But we had seen a bit of a turn there. And I think at some point, the earnings picture for most of big tech, and you, you have to be more discerning within that sector, but earnings should hold up. And I think that we are going to see technology do better into the end of the year. We have another little spike in yields now. I'm not sure if that continues. I think it will retreat later in the year as we see how much of these uh, rate hikes we've priced in and that growth is going to slow as a result of all the hiking. And that should help technology lead the market higher. So I, I'm really fascinated with the earnings outlook, SD, especially because it seems like consensus, again, on both sides of the Atlantic, for US and UK, for European earnings, really is too high into next year. Don't you think that higher rates and inflation um, crimp margins in a big way? Well, we've had, we already had that expectation for the second quarter, right? Earnings did come out better than expected. Companies are doing better. We do need to see earnings expectations come down a little bit. One, just from an inflationary perspective, right? That would be better for the inflation outlook for next year if those prices are coming back down, um, as you say. So something to look at, but it feels like everyone's waiting for those earnings downgrades to come through. And I'm not sure how big of a surprise it would be depending on the scale of it. And again, those consumer numbers for now still holding up mostly okay, some shift uh, in spending patterns. But is that new news that earnings need to come down compared to earlier in the year? I'm not convinced. SD, for the likes of both the Federal Reserve, but I argue this perhaps has more to do with the ECB. I'm curious about the currency story. How much of the European weakness has less to do with the energy crisis and more to do uh, with the lack of clarity around the tools that the ECB is using? We've seen uh, that the euro has really just borne the brunt of all of the concerns for Europe. So the growth concern, the energy concern, Certainly the central bank concern, you can add Italian spreads, and of course there's uncertainty around whether that would qualify under the new ECB tool. Now we know that they have a very difficult decision to make with inflation above 9% and rising potentially, and a mandate of 2% and no, well, they have financial stability, so that still counts, and they'll find a way to work around that. Very difficult decision for the ECB and the fact that we don't have that many details and we don't know what's included, uh, I think is being reflected, but it's probably still mostly about inflation, mostly about uh, the gas and electricity situ situation and therefore uh, the Russia-Ukraine war uh, that's weighing on the euro. SD Dweck, thank you very much indeed. CIO at Flowbank. On that note, by the way, Italian benchmark 10 years currently at 394, so closing in on 4%. Uh, yields up about five basis points. SD Dweck, though, saying uh, that risk opportunities uh, looking a little bit more favorable. Those June lows uh, will hold, is the call. OK, coming up, new rules in China may affect hundreds of millions of dollars in revenue for chip making NVIDIA. We're going to have the latest next. This is Bloomberg. may not be etched into any record books, but no, following him around, no, it's no, clear no, that it's not for lack of trying. Jeez. We were constantly hustling behind him as he caught up with executives in the portfolio companies and reminisced with former and current players. He was a day trader. He taught himself 
Self, self-made day trader. Yeah. And so he's on the bus after a game in New England, and he's day trading on the bus, and Bill Belichick sees him and cuts him on the spot. Oh, you know, yeah. In many ways, it's a convention, yeah. right, of the people that I don't see maybe once a year. And so it's kind of all come together, my firm, our charity, our fundraising efforts, and then the friends that are around, my dad and my brother. It all happens right there as a confluence of all these parts of my life that have found its common center. No one covers the world like Bloomberg. We have to get interest rates higher and bring inflation back to our targets. Spare capacity is becoming scarce. We are running on thin ice. No one deliberately wants to go into battle, but we sleep walk into conflict. With unmatched reach and resources from more than 120 countries, the moment news breaks, 24 hours a day, Bloomberg, your global business authority. This is Bloomberg Surveillance Early Edition. I'm Tom McKenzie in London with Matt Miller and Kriti Gupta in New York. Now, NVIDIA is falling after it warned new US rules could prevent it from exporting some artificial intelligence chips to China. The company will need government approval to sell the chips to Chinese customers, putting about $400 million in sales at risk. Debbie Wu, who covers the tech supply chain for Bloomberg, joins us now from Taipei. Uh, Debbie, thanks for joining us on this story. What is the latest? What do we know then about these new restrictions that the US is putting on companies like NVIDIA? So uh, both NVIDIA and uh AMD have uh, received notices from uh, the U.S. government that they will they will need uh, approval to uh, sell some of their products to uh, Chinese customers, and then the reason for this is that uh, uh, these products uh, have a potential military uh, use, or they could go to a military uh, uh, end users, and the uh, products that uh, are being affected are high-end uh, GPUs that could be used as. Uh, uh, on uh, uh, AI functions. And this is the latest uh, US move to curb China's chip technology progress because uh, uh. the uh, US fears that uh, uh, China could use these uh, cutting edge tech to uh, uh, build its uh, military cloud and then uh, further uh, conduct uh, further uh, surveillance on its uh, population. Right. I mean, this is you know ongoing, it feels like, since the Trump trade war into this administration. Remind us of some of the other recent moves that the U.S. has made to curb China's access to chips? So uh, actually, the uh, uh, probably the uh, most impactful move that uh, the Trump administration has made is uh, restrict China's uh, uh, access to uh, the advanced chip-making uh, equipment from uh, the Dutch company ASML. So uh, the uh, Ch China now cannot get uh, ASML's most advanced extreme, uh, extreme uh, ultraviolet uh, lithography machines. But uh, the uh, uh, Biden administration has made some further moves, including uh, over the past month or two, it has told uh, equipment suppliers in the U.S. not to sell China uh, gears that can make chips that's uh, 40 nanometer or more advanced. And this means that uh, while China still will still be able to make uh, uh, mature chips, it probably uh, its capability to uh, build uh, advanced chips at home will be uh, seriously hampered without support from uh, U.S. companies. Debbie, I'm curious about what this means in terms of timing. Is this all these geopolitical tensions, is it coming at a good time in regards to the idea that there might be this kind of uh, decline in the momentum for global demand? Can you add a little bit of color on that? I think one thing that's really uh, interesting is like uh, the U.S. midterms are coming up, and then uh, it seems like uh, the Democrats could uh, face a uh, tough battle uh, battle uh, ahead of the uh, uh, elections. So uh, it's but at the same time, it seems like uh, there's a bipartisan consensus that uh, uh, the U.S. government and the Congress have to be on top, uh, be tough on China. So uh, it could be that. Uh, uh, by uh, making uh, tightening uh, uh, China's ex access for China to uh, 
uh, secure advanced technologies, the uh, Biden administration could uh, appear to be uh, tough on uh, Beijing, and this could be a good uh, booster for their uh, uh, mid mid midterm uh, prospect. But at the same time, mm. as the uh, you know uh, each government. Uh, major governments around the world are racing to build up uh, chip capacity at home. It is uh, probably important for uh, Washington to make sure that uh, China does not catch up with uh, the West in a very uh, short period of time. Debbie, if we zoom out a bit, what, what is the situation in terms of supply of semiconductors? That we've heard from some companies about inventory buildup. Are we getting back to kind of pre-pandemic levels of supply? Uh, so we it. It is a bit more complex than that. So uh, we have seen uh, companies like NVIDIA, uh, AMD, and Micron offering a uh, really uh, weak business outlook over the past month. Uh, but at the same time, the, uh, there are some companies that continue to say that they cannot get enough chips to build their products. So uh, sort of in light of this context, uh, chip maker Broadcom actually is expected to uh, provide, uh, uh, to grow at the uh, most uh, uh, to grow at the fastest pace uh, since the first quarter of uh, 2018. So uh, it looks like it really depends on what kind of uh, segment or uh, what kind of uh, mm. chips you are uh, making. So if you are making the kind of chips that uh, still some companies lack, then uh, you probably would be uh, doing better, very better than uh, your uh, peers. Okay, so a little bit of nuance when it comes to these inventory buildups. And of course, Debbie, we're with the latest on these US restrictions, the impact on Nvidia. Thank you. Joining us out of Taipei, coming up on Bloomberg Technology, sticking with the tech story, CrowdStrike CEO George Kurtz. That is going to be at 5 p.m. in New York. That's 10 p.m. in London. This is Bloomberg. make for good headlines. The reality is that even if every car on the roads today went electric, it wouldn't be enough to curb global emissions to avoid catastrophic climate change. Greenhouse gas emissions from transportation account for about 29% of total U.S. greenhouse gas emissions. So what about the other 71%? Buildings across America burn fossil fuels to operate. What we want to do is make that all electric. Instead of burning oil and gas, to give us the energy and electricity we need, we want to do 100% clean energy, all electric. We want to turn buildings into Teslas. Just like a Tesla or an electric vehicle is all electric with no fossil fuels, we want to do that with our buildings. And if we can do it in one building, we can do it in all buildings. And if we do it in all buildings, we'll reduce 30% of US greenhouse gas emissions. Bloomberg has enhanced search on the terminal to deliver what you need when you need it. Now, you can simply type phrases in everyday English in the command line. Compare financials. Find people. Analyze markets. You can enter phrases or ask questions. What do you want to know today? Ask a question or visit SearchGo to find answers now.
This is Bloomberg Surveillance Early Edition. I'm Matt Miller with Kriti Gupta in New York and Tom McKenzie in London. Tom Keen joins us now, co-anchor of Bloomberg Surveillance, the original. And Tom, what's your single best chart for the day? My single best chart is I just wish it was the end of August and nothing was going on. Unfortunately, that is not the case this morning, Matt. We have some really interesting, if not August-like historic markets shown in foreign exchange with sterling through 116, some other interesting levels as well. Let's look at the tension in the memory of 1998 and even back to 1991. Asia DXY, this is a snapshot of currency weakness of the Pacific Rim without Japan. The Asian financial crisis over on the left, the broad long-term recovery of Asia as they learned lessons of the West. And now the big rollover where today we break down and go back to 2004 at levels. This is profound. I should note moments ago, J.P. Morgan publishes and reaffirms again, possibly to the middle 140s. That is unimaginable. And Tom, with that weakness that you're seeing in Asia, and I'd say China specifically overnight, you have some pretty good commodity moves as well. Talk to us about your lineup to discuss some of that. Well, we're going to fold it in here. On a Thursday into Jobs Day, obviously Jobs is going to be front and center. We're going to talk to U.S. economists about that. But far more, it's a linkage of foreign exchange into Fed policy and oil. Jean Bovin is without question our lead here. He could be a future governor of his Bank of Canada. He is at BlackRock. And Francisco Blanche on short notice comes in. We're thrilled to have a leader of Bank of America hydrocarbons on new weak oil. Tom Keen, we thank you as always. Let's head to our What to Watch segment. I'm specifically watching Broadcom earnings. The chip sector has become uh, extremely interesting just in the last 24 hours. We heard from NVIDIA. We've heard about these Chinese lockdowns. Broadcom is going to come out with their earnings after the bell. Remember, their strategy uh, has long, for a very long time been to acquire and to get bigger. How does that really work in an environment where you're looking at more antitrust scrutiny and now, of course, uh, this background of pain in the chip sector, Matt? Yeah, it's going to be huge. Um, um, to watch that sector today. I'm watching um, the big box retailers. Because of the um, uh, Bed Bath & Beyond reorganization, they're going to take a loan. They're going to buy a ton of shares. They're going to close like over 100 stores, hopefully not the one um, out in Westchester on Central Avenue. Uh, I just think it's a huge move, not just for Bed Bath & Beyond, but for a number of those that line strip malls around the country. And it reminds me of of old school, which Tom McKenzie hasn't seen. And Tom, I don't think you've seen many Will Ferrell mov movies at all, so I thought I would give you my a top three. A single one. You've not so seen one? Your, so right. I, I would top... start with, if yeah. I were you, I would start with Step Brothers, because I think it's an absolute masterpiece. I would then move on to the other guys uh, with Mark Wahlberg, as well as Dwayne Johnson and Michael Keaton. Um, it's amazing as well. And then, you know, old school is unmissable. You have to have seen that, I think, to be a grown man. <laughs> okay. That's number three on your list. And that's also to understand Bed Bath. No, you didn't. You lined up my weekend as well. Thank you very much, Matt. Uh, so from the movie rundown to a slightly more serious topic, the IAEA officials. So these are these, uh, of course, nuclear uh, atomic agency officials. They're on the ground in Ukraine. I think it's really important. There's a key risk around the Zaporizhia nuclear power plant. That's in the east of the country. They're making their way there. There is still shelling. We're going to see whether or not they can actually inspect this plant. They've been handing out the Ukrainians iodine pills around this area because they're so concerned about a potential nuclear fallout. Russian forces are embedded there. So we're watching that story as well. OK, that is it uh, for early edition. More surveillance is ahead. I'm just going to give you a quick update on where the markets stand at this point in the trading day. Losses of 1.4% across the benchmark here in Europe. US futures, S&P E-mini is pointing lower by 6 tenths of a percent. Stay with us. This is Bloomberg.
what do you say to the cynics that say, look, it, it's all nice and fine, but a lot of it is greenwashing, and you're not a good company, you're just a less toxic company than some of the other oil majors? Well, um, the first thing to say is that, you know, I'm a big believer in we need to put ourselves in other person's shoes in life in general. And so I understand that point of view. And I get that people have that perspective. I don't agree with that, obviously, but I understand where they're coming from. We have an enormous challenge as society, which is to provide the world with reliable, affordable, and clean energy. That's what society wants. That's what society needs. And I believe in my heart that a company like BP is actually one of the few companies in the world who can actually make that happen. We can talk about the things that we're going to grow and over the coming years. And I find it hugely exciting and energizing for our organization. But that's what the world needs. And you simply can't go against the grain of society. You can't defy gravity. And that's why we're making the change that we're making. On the David Rubenstein Show, peer-to-peer -peer conversations, I uncover the untold stories of the world's most successful leaders. Watch Wednesdays on Bloomberg Television. However you get your this news. This is Bloomberg Daybreak with Lee. I'm Bloomberg Radio. Welcome to Daybreak Australia. This is Bloomberg Technology. This is Bloomberg Green. On TV, radio, and the web, this is Bloomberg. rate hikes that they've already done, we haven't felt the full impact of them yet. There's a lot of tightening in the pipeline. We really should be focusing on the objective of the Fed, which is to get growth down, to get inflation down. And of course, the interest rate hikes are just a means to an end. Now we're at a point where uh, do we go back to the don't fight the Fed mantra? There are different stories of what is happening to people when we think about the economy. There is a, at least mild recession coming in the U.S., and there's also recession unavoidable for us in the Eurozone. This is Bloomberg Surveillance with Tom Keen, Jonathan Farrow, and Lisa Abramowitz. Hello, September. Where did that come from? See you. You're going to keep singing, TK? In September. Let's give that a miss. Live from New York City this morning. Good morning, good morning. For our audience worldwide on TV and radio, this is Bloomberg Surveillance alongside Tom Keen. I'm Jonathan Farrow. Together with Anna this morning, Bramo, I'm told, it's going to be back on Monday, maybe. maybe. Futures down about seven tenths of one percent on the S and P 500. TK, what a brutal end to the month of August. Surveillance so break exclusive of Abramo. It's Tuesday, Monday's Labor Day. John will figure that out at some point here. John, no one told a, me, Tom. It is what? No one told me. Oh, Again, day okay. off, there no we weekend. Go. Day off on Monday. Nice. Yeah. There we go. Here we go. Here's where we are, folks. And John knows this. The markets are moving. Forget about a lazy August Thursday into Jobs Day tomorrow. John, every part of my launch pad on Bloomberg has an important story this morning. How about we start with a crushing new weakness in Sterling? Oh, Tom, a break at 116, uh, 115.99 on my screen right now. And, Tom, I was looking at the month-to-date performance last month, just yesterday for the month of August. <clears throat> Guilt yields were up, Tom, 94 basis points yeah. on a UK 10-year. And still, pound sterling posted... Right. The biggest monthly loss going all the way back to late 2016 and moving 4.5%. So, Tom, high yields are not helping out right. pound sterling. We're going to brief you on all these aspects, and we're also going to give you the research. It's literally coming out in real time. John, HSBC, moments ago, Christopher Hirsch, uh publishes, and he emphasizes, John, the longer tightening cycle that Europe and the United Kingdom need to deal and with. And more front-loading as well, Tom, particularly <clears throat> out of the ECB. We're tearing up 75, Tom. This is the real deal now. Yeah, this Everyone's is... getting on board. Bloomberg Economics yeah. early this morning talking about 75 on Thursday next week from this ECB. Calendar check, September 8th. The date matters. Serena Williams will no doubt be hitting the ball at that time as well. John, this is really important, and you see it indicated in foreign exchange today. Yes, sterling and also Japanese yen. All of a sudden, 140 is here. We've got to discuss China as well. Anna, I know you've been following that yeah. all morning out of London. Let's talk about it. Chengdu. 20.9 million residents mm. facing lockdown. Yeah. What year is this, 22 or 2020? 
Absolutely. When you read the details of what lockdown means in Chengdu for 21 million people, it sounds like a distant memory to many people in other parts of the world. But we know that's not the case in China. And big questions for the market around November. Does the policy change? Does the policy change, Tom? How many times have you raised that issue, TK? I, I, the number I, one issue. How can we have an outlook on the global economy without an understanding of whether we have COVID zero or not from I'm, the Chinese? I'm going to channel John Hopkins here and just say it's hugely a science, and they're going to have to figure it out in their own original way. To me, John, what's the story here for our viewers and listeners in the West is it's not, you know, I say I go to China, John, I go 845 feet from the Pacific Ocean into the Mandarin Hotel. To the bar. Okay, deep into China. Thank you. Deep, deep. Chengdu is lobby. 845 miles from Hong Kong. That's what this story is about. It's not about the fancy Pacific Rim. It's about greater China. We'll pick up on that story a little bit more, a little bit later. Let's pick up on a price action this morning. And good morning to all of you just tuning in. Equity futures down about 7 tenths of 1% on the S&P to kick off the month of September. We're lower. We're negative more than one full percentage point on the NASDAQ. Four-day losing streak on the S&P 500 over the last four Four days, we've declined by almost six percentage points. Yields unchanged on a 10-year, 318.33. Had a little look at 350 yeah. on a two-year, Tom. Where are we right now? 347. Let's call it 348 on a two-year yield. Euro dollar just about holding on to parity, 10023, negative a third of 1%. And Tom, back in the 80s, the 80s in the mix on WTI, 87.80. We're down about 2% on crude. We'll brief you on oil today as we go towards $2.99. We're not there yet. $88. And, of course, 86 level is the weakness that we saw weeks ago. Emerita Sen will be with us and thrilled that on short notice, Francisco Blanche of Bank of America cool. will join. I missed that one, Tom. Looking forward to it. A little well, bit later in the program. You weren't at the 4 a.m. meeting because you I'm, slide I'm in here at 5.52. In. I wake up a little bit later than you now, yeah, Tom. I'm getting older. Yeah. It happens. <laughs> Phil Orlando joins us. Older. Chief Equity Market Young Strategist. Phil Orlando. At Federated Hermes. <laughs> hey, Phil, this move, are we heading back to the June lows or not? Uh, we, we think we are. Uh, our macro policy committee met uh, a week ago Monday after the equity market, the S&P 500, had just rallied by 19 percent between mid-June and mid-August. Uh, the market's perception was that uh, inflation had peaked and was going to have this immaculate decline back to 2 percent in an eye blink. Uh, the Fed was done tightening they were going to turn around and start cutting interest rates by the middle of next year. And, and we just felt that that was a head fake. And, and so we took some more chips off the table, uh, you know, a fortnight ago. And uh, our view is that that 19 percent rally, we're going to retrace some or right. all of that over the course of the next month or two. Phil, to channel the great Sir John Templeton, how do you determine when shares are on sale? Well, we think they're on sale right now because the market got the fundamentals wrong. And and I think Powell, last Friday, while you guys were out in Jackson Hole, uh, read the market, the Riot Act, and said, look, you, you've got the call on inflation wrong. You've got uh, the Fed's process wrong. We're going to cut. We're going to continue to hike interest rates, sort of channel our inner <laughs> Paul Volcker until we get this right and get inflation right. back to our trend line. We, we think we're going to measure that process from an inflation standpoint in years, not months. Right. Uh, Phil, Federated lived the collapse of Pittsburgh in 73-74. I mean, the great Federated shop in western Pennsylvania. You and I have seen stochastic inflation rises that rapidly become disinflation. Is there a risk that you miss a disinflationary trend? At this point in the cycle, no, because it, it's not just one thing. It's broad-based. It's sustainable. It's sticky. It's wages. It's shelter. It's, it's food. It's energy. The Federal Reserve, I think, knows that. I mean, what did Powell say last week? Yeah, we got a good July number, but that doesn't mean the fight's over. And I think, you know, he's absolutely right. We could see energy prices uh, rebound over the course of the next couple of months as Russia uh, weaponizes energy, uh, you know, with, with Europe as uh, our, we've drawn the SPR down too much uh, in the mm. face of a, a hurricane season that hasn't developed yet. Uh, OPEC next week is talking about cuts rather than increases. Uh, energy yeah. prices could rise and inflation could fall. Okay, so there's a lot to talk about when it comes to commodities. Phil, uh, sticking with how far 
stocks have to fall. I caught up with Mike Wilson uh, yesterday of Morgan Stanley, and he was saying stocks have dropped on changing Treasury expectations and Fed expectations, but not on cuts to outlook yet. And he, he suggests that we've got another leg down because we need to be more realistic about what companies are going to be able to deliver. How much weaker does that story have to get? Uh, uh, agree uh, that that we talked about the the retracing back to the 3600 level. We think earnings estimates in the in the second quarter started to come down. We think the third quarter could be worse uh, in terms of sort of right sizing estimates given the slowdown in consumer spending. Uh, this is going to be a challenging back to school season. It could be a challenging Christmas season. Remember, the consumer accounts for 70 percent of GDP. Uh, so you know, our view is that earnings estimates, growth estimates need to come down, and I'm not sure that that's completely uh, mm. in the stock market right now. Growth estimates need to come down, and we also keep an eye on all of the data, the inflation data, the jobs data, and the like. How does the jobs picture factor into your models? When you look at what stocks do, how do you digest what's happening on the jobs front? Because we all know it's important, but what's the linkage? That, that's a significant uh, trend because... The, the ability of the consumer, or businesses for that matter, to spend is a function of people being gainfully employed. You, you look at tomorrow's jobs number, consensus number at 300,000. Our internal models are showing about 170,000, about half that. Wow. You look at the ADP report we saw yesterday. The consensus for the ADP report was 300K. They came in around 170,000. Look at initial claims. We're going to get an update on that today. The claims are up 50% over the course of the last five months, about 80,000 claims. Historically, when claims increase by 50,000 or more off of their trough, you start the inflation clock. Uh, I'm sorry, the recession clock. And the recession clock then uh, indicates that the economy typically glides in a recession 12 to 18 months later. So, so we think we're looking at a recession at some point next year. We don't think that's in the market right now in terms of earnings estimates, economic growth, or share prices. So with that in mind, let's squeeze this in. Tomorrow, if we get a disappointment, in a word, is bad news good news? It, bad news is not good news because look at the the ADP report yesterday. We missed on the on the the jobs number, but what was the wage inflation number? That number was was north of seven percent. That that's a very yeah. dangerous combination, a stagflationary combination. Stocks have to go down, bond yields up, and and you know we think stocks are are going to be choppy for the next Rachel, month or two. What a tough time for the equity market balls to hear Phil say that, Tom. Good news early this week was bad news, and apparently bad news is. Yeah, bad news. I, I, bad news, bad news, good news. Phil Orlando uh, of Federated Hermits. Lucky I think, to have thank Anna you, with Phil. us this morning as well, Tom, because we need to talk about <clears throat> these strikes out of Germany. Anna, I was looking at Lufthansa. Yeah. Have you seen this? To cancel almost all Frankfurt Munich flights today. Yeah. Yeah, Back to this. I mean, they're, they're in good company, though, I suppose, if you're looking at strike action, certainly strike action here in the UK, within the aviation sector, other parts of Europe as well, and a lot of people talking about how this just gets tougher and tougher through the winter. The economy minister in the FT, Tom, talking about German businesses shutting down because of energy well, the and zinc, energy yeah, issues. The I mean, how much story. of this are we going to see, TK? We're going to see a lot, lot more of this, John, and I want to channel the Irish Times. Thank you, Zero I'm doing this on the British Hour, folks. Anna Edwards. John Farrow. Very cool. It's very cool. Well, we I feel appreciate like you being with us, Tom. For a moment, I, I, let me straighten my bow tie out and pretend I'm at the BBC. John, Ireland, Galway. This is a, a set of miles directly west of Dublin. A little coffee shop, actually a high-end coffee shop. John, you and I can't afford. Poppy Fields Cafe. They don't do a full English. They do a full Irish with black and white pudding. Her utility bill mm. was $10,000. That's ridiculous. Ten thousand dollars it's going to put out you, put you guys can afford it though with your dollars tom just absolutely me with my pounds brutal <laughs> tom Keane, anna edwards just jonathan unreal. ferrow this morning coming up jean bavan at 7 a.m eastern time out of black rock on the appropriate time horizon to get inflation back to target john is just absolutely fantastic on central bank policy we'll catch up with him a little bit later futures down seven tenths of one percent from new york this is bloomberg Keeping you up to date with news from around the world with the best word, I'm Ritika Gupta. Former President Trump has accused the Justice Department of criminalizing his possession of personal documents. He made the allegation in a court filing seeking to bolster his case for a neutral third party to review documents seized by the FBI at his Florida home. The agents were investigating the presence of hundreds of highly classified White House records. 
In Alaska, Democrat Mary Peltola has defeated former Governor Sarah Palin in a special election for the state's only seat in the House of Representatives. That widens the Democrats' narrow majority, and it sets up a rematch with Palin in November for a full term. Peltola's support for abortion rights was seen as one of the deciding factors. In the UK, Liz Truss made a couple of eye-catching promises in her final pitch to become the next Prime Minister. Truss, who's favoured over Rishi Sunak in the Conservative Party leadership race, ruled out introducing any new taxes or energy rationing this winter. The next Prime Minister will be announced Monday. Bloomberg's learned that Hong Kong wants to end hotel quarantine in November. That would be just before a summit of global bankers and an international rugby competition. Public health officials are pushing back on a plan because of a resurgence of COVID cases. And Lufthansa says it will cancel almost all flights to and from its Frankfurt and Munich hubs on Friday. That comes after the German Airlines Pilot Union called for a one-day strike. About 800 flights and 130,000 passengers will be affected. Global News 24 hours a day on air and on Bloomberg Quick Take, powered by more than 2,700 journalists and analysts in more than 120 countries. I'm Ruska Gupta. This is Bloomberg. delaying its next major iPad software update, iPad OS 16, by about a month from September to October. Apple made the decision for a number of reasons, including a still buggy stage manager multitasking interface and an order to link the launch closer to the more similar Mac OS Ventura. Still, it's an unusual move. Since shifting the launches to the fall in 2011, Apple has released its new iPhone and iPad software updates simultaneously each year around September. By staggering the releases, users may find some issues around compatibility with cross-device features like retracting and editing messages in iMessage, the new shared iCloud photo library, and the new feature for transferring FaceTime calls between iPhones and iPads. It will also make it a bit harder for developers to launch apps that run on both the iPad and iPhone that require new APIs and features found across iPadOS 16 and iOS 16. Regardless, it was still, of course, the right move. Stage Manager on iPadOS 16 is still quite buggy. I don't find it particularly intuitive, and it's not compatible with most iPads and many third-party apps on the App Store. The feature clearly needs some more polish. And complaints from consumers about Stage Manager will now no longer probably overshadow the earlier launch of the iPhone 14. <laughs> Markets are preparing to close, but the day is not over yet. A stock that is now up about 45%. A lot of volatility right now. You need the power of the Bloomberg Terminal to get you market-moving data before anyone else. These numbers are much higher than expected. Upgraded today to overweight. You need top analysts to bring you exclusive global insight into cross-asset markets. The mini bond market. China is a really big focus. Bitcoin ain't paying along today. It's going to be short-term. Bloomberg Markets, the close. Weekdays on Bloomberg. world on demand. Hear from leading economists, policymakers, and individuals.
industry experts via live and on-demand webinars, only from Bloomberg. Start exploring to see what's moving the markets. Visit Bloomberg.com webinars. Markets come down in Europe from the financial centers of the world. Bloomberg Markets European Close with Guy Johnson in London and Alex Steele in New York. Real-time numbers, real-time analysis, weekdays. Last month's jobs report caught everyone off guard. This is quite a surprise. Oh my, as oh Dick my. Enberg would say. That is a wow statistic. That recession talk just got a freezing cold shower. This Friday, the surveillance team brings you the crucial jobs data and expert analysis at terminal speed. It's good news, bad news, bad news, good news. We're walking that fine line. We still have a large gap between jobs and workers, but at least we're moving in the right direction. The market has 2023 wrong. The August jobs report, Friday on Bloomberg Television and Radio. My current view is that it will be necessary, necessary to move the Fed funds rate up to somewhat above 4% by early next year and hold it there. I do not anticipate the Fed cutting the Fed funds rate target next year. That was Loretta Mester, but it could have been anyone on the Fed over the last week because they are all saying the same thing. Live from New York City, good morning to you. Alongside Tom Keane, I'm Jonathan Farrow. Bramo's going to be back on Tuesday, I'm told. Apparently it's a long weekend here stateside. That's good. I'm now Welcome dialed in and up to speed. <laughs> Thank you, TK. Anna Edwards alongside us today. Here's the price action. Futures down about three quarters of 1% on the S&P 500. On the NASDAQ, we're down a little more than one full percentage point. The hits keep coming. We can talk about the chip makers a little bit later. Let's talk about Chengdu. Lockdown in a city southwest China. 20.9 million residents. This is still going yeah. on. Just the hits the bulls are taking, Tom, across the board. It's every single morning at the moment. And, and right now in Hong Kong, as I think we had on First Word News there, John, they're even talking about blowing up what is an attempt of major meetings in their financial capital because of COVID. Maybe. Maybe they make a move there. I want to talk about sterling as well, Tom. 115.82. Weaker for a fifth straight day now. Yeah. Weaker pound sterling. And here's the right. number for you. 115.82, Tom, as you said. A right. 115 handle after the weakest month for pound sterling going all the way back to 2016 and the weakest level going all the way back to spring 2020. The heritage of Bloomberg surveillance, folks, is we adapt and adjust when the news changes. Overnight, we put a FX push on. We're thrilled to bring you now from Bank of America out of Harvard in the University of Ken Rogoff. Thanos Van Vakitis joins us, global head of G10 FX strategy. Thanos, honored to have you with us this morning. Uh, John's got a lot of questions on the dynamics of selection selected pairs. I want to go to the broader picture, which is you frame nominal GDP as being way too high, and then you bring it over to flows in balance of payments. Explain why recession changes foreign exchange. Well, central banks obviously are focused on inflation, but they don't want to have a hard landing. So the market uh, has this recession fear, hoping that this will turn the central banks less hawkish. However, if we assume that central banks effectively trying to balance these two things that are targeting nominal GDP, the truth is that nominal GDP growth in the major economies today is well above the historical average. Not only that, the forecast for next year is that it will remain well above the historical average. So it is hard to argue that the fear of recession will stop the central banks. So we continue focusing on inflation, and this is what is driving effects right now. This is why the dollar is right. strong. Thanos, of August of 98, of the summer of 91 as well, there's a rollover to EM. I see Looney out to a 132. I see selected Asian currencies rolling over with ADXY out to 2004 weakness. Can this redound over to emerging markets? So far, emerging markets, uh, we can say in relative terms always, they've reacted well to the dollar rally. We have not seen the sharp sell-off that we have seen uh, in past uh, uh, cases. Positioning also is uh, not uh, extreme. The market is short EM, but uh, slightly so. Um, we would be cautious as long as the dollar is strong, as long as the Fed is hawkish, it is hard to see a recovery in EMFX. A lot also depends on China, 
the weakness in CAY is uh, affecting the rest of uh, EM. So I would argue a cautious approach uh, for now. Maybe EM would be a good trade looking to next year, but this would require uh, the Fed to pause and US inflation to come sufficiently down. Hmm. So, Thanos, let me ask you about one currency that's very vulnerable then to strong dollar, and that is the pound, it seems. One of our colleagues, Simon White, uh, writing today about the UK in his calculations having one of the largest twin deficits in the world. He puts that at 11% of GDP. He says that's a lot of kindness from, uh, from foreign capital. How low does the pound get? He says thinking about parity is not off the table now. Now, you have to go back to 1984 to see such a low level at the end of the Volcker tightening cycle. It has been like the perfect storm for the UK, a mixed macroeconomic uh, uh, policy picture, the highest inflation risks in G10, uh, political uncertainty. I think uh, the Bank of England job has been extremely difficult. I think uh, at this point, everybody is bearish selling for uh, a good reason. The twin deficit that you mentioned is, is definitely one factor. I think what matters uh, after we get the new PM next week is first, uh, what we're going to see on fiscal policy. We need a responsible fiscal policy. Second, mm -hmm. what are we going to see on Brexit? We need a compromise uh, with the EU on uh, the issue of the Northern Ireland deal. If on both these fronts we get a negative outcome, indeed sterling can weaken even more. They can even weaken even more. And what about longer term inflation expectations, Thanos? The Bank of England out with its survey of financial pro uh, professionals, over 4% in three years. This is not an inflation rate that's coming down in a hurry. Now, UK inflation has not peaked yet. We actually have it uh, at 16% uh, uh, in January. I know that some of our competitors have it even higher. And we do have a, a recession in the UK. So compared to the rest of the G10, we clearly have the most severe stagflation scenario in the case of uh, uh, the UK. To a large extent, it has to do with labor market bottlenecks. Uh, we have a stretched labor market. Uh, is not because the economy is doing well. Uh, to a large extent, it has also to do with Brexit uh, constraints. So this is keeping inflation high, despite the fact that the Bank of England has been hiking. Again, it's a very difficult uh, policy uh, mix. So bottom line, in the UK, we have not seen the worst both on inflation and on the recession. Brutal. Thanos, thank you. Thanos van Bikidis of Bank of America. Thanos, thank you. Sterling 115.86. Here's my pledge. If we get to parity on cable, Tom, I'm putting in a transfer request. And going home. Well, these are serious things. I mean, John, don't make light of that. And that, that I'm not. I'm, I'm, I'm for that, real. Can you imagine, yeah. Tom? Can you, the American tourism right now into Europe is booming. Is off the charts. Off the charts. It is off yes. the charts. I'm I part went of there, that. all I could hear was American accents. Yeah. Most people have heard the same. Well, I, it's a dominance of the dollar until it doesn't work. And I want to make clear I haven't done the work recently, John, but I do a technical study, log study of dollar to say when do we get to a plaza accord when people say enough? We're not there yet. That's my major message. When do you that. think we are there, Tom? I haven't done the work. I've got to look at yen, euro, and, and it, it's it's a way. It's a way. John, I got a major issue. Anna Edwards, you and I are here. On sure. the last week of the summer, Labor Day week, the closest I get to Valencia, Spain, is a damn orange at Whole Foods. That's as close as I get. Why is some of our staff on that island off of Valencia? How do you pronounce it, Tom? I Ibiza? can't pronounce it. I, Ibiza? I just, Abiza, like Anna. Pronounce? How do you? Anna's there every winter. Abiza, Anna. Abiza. 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 Why but is I our don't speak Spanish? We need to ask Maria our, today. Oh. I don't know, John. Why is our staff in Abiza? We're not.
In the past two decades, China has built large infrastructure projects in almost every country in Africa. African governments themselves said we are tired of aid and charity. We want to do trade, we want to be treated like partners. The Chinese came along and said, great, we don't do aid and charity, we want to do business with you. Global Gateway will mobilize 300 billion euros till 2027. Now the US and Europe are answering back with their own infrastructure initiatives to counter China, but African experts are skeptical. China has been that guy around the corner with, you know, a bouquet of flowers to Africa, the US, you know, Europe and the UK of time and time again say, be careful of the flowers you see out of the window, they have thorns on them. What's happening on Wall Street? I think Jay Powell said things that were indefensible. Need to catch up? This is Bloomberg Wall Street Week. I'm David Weston. We've got the information and insights. We think that's the next secular shift. From business's most influential and instrumental. Yes, it's about renewables. It's a challenging dynamic. This is a level of uncertainty that we haven't had to deal with. Bloomberg Wall Street Week, live Friday with replays all weekend on Bloomberg Television and Radio. Today's CFOs are reshaping the C-suite, positioning companies to meet the next generation of challenges, breaking out of traditional roles. One of the most important things is looking around the corner. Look for Chief Future Officer on Bloomberg. Special thanks to Lou Wang of Bloomberg News for breaking down the numbers for the month of August. Just truly brutal. Every single asset class, excluding maybe the FX space, Tom, because it's the US dollar that delivers some strength, but corporate debt, high yield, down on the month, treasuries, down on the month, commodities, down on the month, and then round it all out with equities, down on the month, yeah, equity the, futures, the, down John, again, is, kick off September, Tom, we're down about 7 tenths of 1% on the S&P. Continue, John, it's too important, we've got to keep with the data check, but the coordination here, the correlation, rather, is, t it, it is tangible on September 1. It was a tough month of August, let's be clear about that. Yeah. So we've got four days of losses on the S&P 500, previous four days down almost 6%, down something like 5.8% over just four days as yields start to climb higher. We took out the highs of the year of June 14th in the last 24 hours or so. Here's a snapshot of the bond board right now. Yields come back in about a basis point, backing away from 350 <coughs> at 348 on a two-year. But look at the work we've done over the last month in Europe. Want to take a snapshot of the UK and of Germany. And then look at the foreign exchange rate as well. Let's start with sterling. Gilt yields over the last month have moved more than 100 basis points over the last month, right now 286 on a UK 10-year. And Tom, yet, sterling is down by more than 5%. Just think about that. Right. Over the last month, big move higher in yields, and yet still a much, much, much weaker currency. That's true of Europe, too, with yields higher across the board there. That's problematic for these central banks, Tom, as they look to hike interest rates again and try and find a right. firmer footing in that FX market. And, and very quickly here, John, on Italy, we're not through the June spread wideness. The difference in yield between Italy and Germany but it's there, and I would suggest, John, that Italy is so fragile, they can't afford a spread breakdown. And Tom, they're still going to hike maybe 75 basis points on Thursday. What can they do with the balance sheet to try and stop that kind of dislocation, fragmentation, pick your word, whatever they want to call it? Uh, can they achieve that, Tom, given the backdrop, given the fact yeah. we're going into recession, yeah. it seems? Most people assume that's the case in the Europe, and yet this central bank is determined to get rates even higher. Yeah, the theories of uh, eight weeks ago sort of went out the window. What in the gonna, trash. Yeah, in the trash. What we're going to do right now, folks, is drive it back to what matters for you, and that is the jobs report tomorrow, and of course claims, the weekly claims here in two-hour time. Rubila Faruqi joins us, chief U.S. economist, high-frequency economics, always channeling the international views of Carl Weinberg. Rubila, bring it back to America and bring it back to what matters, which is in the ADP report, wages clock 7%. What will we see on a wage spiral tomorrow? Good morning. Thanks for having me. Uh, what we're expecting to see is, uh, you know, still elevated wage gains, uh, you know, maybe a slight tick up, uh, you know, still a five handle on year on year changes in average hourly earnings. Uh, you know, the, the central point of this is what are we seeing on supply? And we really are not seeing any relief on supply. The participation rate has gone down. If you look at the civilian labor force, it's declined in three of the last four months. 
and that is where the stresses lie. And uh, you know, without that, and without any relief on wage gains, you know, the Fed is going to remain focused on these things, and really, the trajectory is not going to change at all. Uh, you know, on tomorrow's numbers. I find the analysis of a Fed <laughs> action, and this goes to Kashkari of Minneapolis, but a Fed action to desire to move the unemployment rate higher to be way too simple. What's the complex part of that analysis that matters for our viewers and listeners? Well, I mean, what we're seeing right now is severe dislocations in the labor market, right? We're seeing supply and demand imbalances. Does the Fed necessarily want to see the unemployment rate go up? No, absolutely not. not. I mean, that's not what central banks want. But, you know, in this instance, you know, we keep hearing about a tight labor market, and Chair Powell, Powell has said a labor market that is, you know, tied to an unhealthy level. So that's what we're trying to figure out. How can this uh, Fed, you know, orchestrate a rate hiking cycle where there's still positive growth, but, and, you know, unemployment goes up, but not by much? And I think the best case for them is that, uh, you know, you, you, you know, the demand side is so strong that you're going to see limited uh, increase in layoffs. But I, I'm not really sure that that uh, is really possible. Okay, Rabila, good morning from London. Um, you talked about participation having dropped off, and clearly it, during COVID and in the immediate aftermath, it was obvious why that was. What's your analysis now of why participation is so poor? There are similarities with the UK market, and it's clear why it's, why it's poor here, but what's the story in the US? I mean, what we're seeing is, you know, uh, elevated retirements that really contributed in a large way. We still have people who are suffering the effects of COVID. <coughs> Excuse me was still affecting, you know, uh, being affected by the effects of COVID. And you're still seeing, you know, some challenges uh, in terms of, you know, prime rate, prime, prime age participation in terms of child care mm -hmm. issues, health issues, elder care issues. So those, still, those things are still, uh, you know, persisting. And it's really not clear that we're going to see any relief. What we did see last time around was, you know, as we were going into uh, in 2019 before the COVID crisis, what we saw was people, a strong labor market did draw people back into the labor force. And that's what the Fed really is looking for, that strong job growth, high inflation, mm. the, you know, the lower of uh, higher wages. Maybe that is where the relief comes in. But really, that's not something that is part of a base case scenario anymore. You know, we've been expecting for participation right. to go up, and we really haven't seen it. So if we want job openings to come down, it has to come from, from unemployment. It has to come from, from layoffs then, Rabila. Well, not necessarily. We do think that demand for labor is going to go down. Uh, but, you know, we're trying to figure out why are layoffs so low? Is it just that demand is strong or is it that right. companies are also reluctant? You know, they've they've suffered, uh, you, know, for, you know, persistent yeah. shortages. So are they just hanging on to their workforce? Are they just reluctant to let right. go of their workers? Rabila, here's the mystery question right now. <laughs> What is non-farm payroll's normal number? It used to be 200, and we'd model out 150. We all got that wrong. That was a great wrong call of a decade. We're now rocking 280, 300,000, 320,000 per month. What's normal? It's very difficult to assess what this labor market is, you know, it, what, what normal is where we are going to balance out. Um, if we look at the numbers, you know, break even is probably around a hundred thousand, maybe slightly really? less. Really, really. But yeah, exactly. And but again, you know, we are basing our analysis on things that prevailed before the before the pandemic. So it's really difficult to assess. Right now, what we're seeing is, you know, extremely solid job growth, uh, and also, I mean, it's it's really not tying in with the concept of. Uh, you know, economy that has really, you know, just flattened out in the first half of the year. But, you know, what's what's appearing now is companies still, uh, you know, uh, adding to their uh, workforce and uh, the unemployment rate at historical lows may be even set to go down a little bit more. And, uh, you know, a Fed that uh, is facing a huge challenge. Rabina, a massive challenge and not just the Fed, the ECB has a challenge of its own. Rabina Faruqi there of High Frequency Economics. Getting you set up for the day ahead. We've got initial jobless claims a little bit later this morning, 8.30 Eastern time. Mike McKee's going to break that down. Then ISM Manufacturing a little bit later. The S&P Global PMI in the United States was pretty brutal, ugly. Mm -hmm. It got ignored, Tom, because we're waiting for the ISM read, and we'll get that at 10 a.m. Eastern mm -hmm. time. 
later this morning. Well, we will. It's September 1. Let's remember that, folks. We vault into the autumnal season. Thank you for the comments on Poetry Corner yesterday. John, when, on, a, on two standard deviations, when you ride the rail, that's a trend in place. In the last 20 minutes, a trend in place on pound sterling is frightening. 115.62. For those not keeping score, John, that is life-changing for all of the United Kingdom. Kit Jukes wrote about this this morning, Tom, over at SOCGEN. It's becoming more and more serious by the right. day. He said, higher guilt yields aren't so helpful when people see them as the price the UK pays to suck in huge amounts of money. And why it's great to have Anna with us today is because we need to talk about the leadership contest and who will be the next prime minister. And Anna, I wonder how much of what we're seeing is about what this next prime minister will have to do to offset some mm. of this pain in the energy market. Yeah, there are certainly, I was reading a note by ING this morning, and, and they were talking about fiscal stimulus and getting clarity from the next leader on what kind of fiscal stimulus it's going to be. Is it going to yeah. be targeted enough <clears throat> to not provoke the Bank of England into even more hikes? Anna, you've got such skill on this, including your interviews with Lawrence the Cat over the last number of years. For our American viewers and listeners, I'm going to ask a question, and I say it with respect. Is Liz Truss like Theresa May? Uh, wow, that probably take quite a long time to answer. I suppose we have to think of, well, is she going to be Prime Minister is probably for the American view is the first thing, and she's up against Rishi Sunak. The polls do suggest that the selectorate, the small group of Tories who are going to vote uh, for her, that she might get this, so she might be the person you need to think about. How long she stays in post, though, is interesting, because the Labour Party running up the polling, uh, if you look at the polling for, for the next general election, which is a couple of years away, uh, it looks like a tough ask for the Tories to hold on to power. They face different problems too, Tom. Yeah. The number one problem, the only issue, is a single-issue government with Theresa May. It was Brexit. For this incoming Prime Minister, Tom, as Anna's talked about, the energy issue is just massive. The cost of utility bills in the UK right. huge. Businesses are already struggling. You've got consumers who will struggle later this year, Tom. It could get a whole lot worse. And what everyone's looking for the incoming government to do is yeah. offset that with fiscal spending. You've got to fold that into the market moment well, okay. that we're talking about at the moment, Tom. If they're going to offset that with fiscal spending, how accommodating is this bond market going to be? To how both wide open is it? Okay. Or rather, how closed is it? To both of you, and let me go to you, John, and drive it forward. Like Churchill having six lives, can Prime Minister Johnson come back? You think maybe make a comeback? So I'm no asking. rules against it, Anna. He could make a comeback if he wanted to make a comeback. Mm, I mean, it's been talked about. But, but at the moment, he's, yeah, if you want to keep it in the here and now, it's about Liz Truss. It's about her fiscal policies. Well, it probably about Liz Truss and her fiscal policies, how targeted they're going to be. And she's committed to no, uh, no tax, uh, tax rises, obviously. What does that mean for energy businesses? That's a, another key question. And this is the number one issue, as Anna points out, Tom. We can't really think about Boris Johnson running for another term as the Prime Minister in the UK. Can we get to the end of the year first? And then, Tom, once we've got through winter, do we have to consider that we have to repeat this act, this dreadful act, next we, winter we should do the and the winter after? I, John, I think we should do the British hour more often. Would you like to do that, TK? I, th I think we could. You appreciate yeah. it. You love it more than I do. I, it's great. Future's down three quarters of one percent. West Ham. The S&P. Nate Shelley. Someone corrected you yesterday. I saw that. Oh, did they? Yeah, I saw that. <laughs> but Nate Shelley's Ted Lasso, Tom. And you don't spell it Nat. It's Nate. Oh, with an I, e. I didn't know that. Y you knew that. Okay. From New York, this is Bloomberg. Keeping you up to date with news from around the world. With the first word, I'm Rutika Gupta. Russia is holding major military exercises with China and India. It's seen as Vladimir Putin's way of pushing back against attempts by the US and its allies to isolate him from the invasion of Ukraine. More than 50,000 troops, 140 aircraft and 60 ships are taking part in the war campaigns in Russia's Far East. In China, the city of Chengdu is locking down its 21 million residents. It's a huge move in the vast western region of the country that had so far been largely untouched by the coronavirus. The lockdown could affect electronics and automaker supply chains. In California, blackouts have been averted so far in the midst of a heat wave that could threaten the supply of electricity through next Monday. The state called off its power grid emergency as night fell and it got cooler. The temperature reached triple digits in much of the state. Shares of NVIDIA and other chip makers are lower today. NVIDIA warned that new rules governing the export of artificial intelligence chips to China may affect hundreds of millions of dollars in revenue. The U.S. is said to be concerned that these processes might be used by the military. 
And in tennis, Serena Williams has extended her stay at the US Open again. The 23-time Grand Slam winner upset number two seed Annette Kontovic 7-6-2-6-6-2 in a second round match. Williams has hinted the Open may be her last tournament. In an interview after last night's match, Williams said, there's still a little left in me. Global News 24 hours a day on air and on Bloomberg Quick Take, powered by more than 2,700 journalists and analysts in more than 120 countries. I'm Ritika Gupta. This is Bloomberg. the industries in an arms race that will lead to spending itself into an oversupply. I mean, that has happened before. You know, we, we, we've looked at this very carefully. And, you know, the digitization of everything. Tell me what aspect of your life, Emily, isn't becoming more digital? Well, I'm right? trying to prevent that, but yes, <laughs> I think it's happening. <laughs> you know, and COVID has accelerated that. The industry cost $500 billion last year the semiconductor industry overall, and estimates are a trillion dollars, a doubling by the end of the decade uh, at that point. I believe those estimates. It's not that there's not going to be some blips and turns on the way, and the majority of that is driven by leadership process technology, of which only three companies can satisfy that need. Has Elon Musk said no to the car factory? Matt. It's still in discussion. Let's see later the final result. Do you think that by bringing people together, that is a way to solve conflict? There must be communication, even if it doesn't necessarily resolve the problem. It is better to have dialogue than to have open conflict. This is a conversation with President Jokowi of Indonesia. Only on Bloomberg. On the David Rubenstein Show, peer-to-peer -peer conversations, I uncover the untold stories of the world's most successful leaders. Watch Wednesdays on Bloomberg Television. Steve's ability on the course may not be etched into any record books, but no, following him around, no, it's clear no, that it's not for lack of trying. Jeez. We were constantly hustling behind him as he caught up with executives in the portfolio companies and reminisce with former and current players. He's a day trader. He taught himself, self-made self day trader. Yes. And so he's on the bus after a game in New England, and he's day trading on the bus, and Bill Belichick sees him and cuts him on the spot. Oh, you know, in many ways, it's a convention, right, of the people that I don't see maybe once a year. And so it's kind of all come together, my firm, our charity, our fundraising efforts, and then the friends that are around, my dad and my brother. It all happens right there as a confluence of all these parts of my life that have found its common center. about the substantial progress that's been made by our teams and the entire G7 toward making the price cap a reality. And as I see it, the price cap will 
advance our two key objectives. A TK found the Treasury Secretary. It was, it, it was, it was exciting. He was, he was looking all weak. <laughs> Janet Yellen, the US Treasury Secretary, just unbelievable, really, to have someone that well qualified. With so much expertise, Tom, and we uh, barely hear don't from get her me going. On, on some of the biggest economic issues at the moment. Let I me, won't get you going. Do you want to go? Sounds no, like you want to go. You're itching. Okay, guy, let me explain this. Yellen, when she, what's great about Janet Yellen is when she gets angry, her voice changes to interior Brooklyn. It's really something uh, to behold. She owns a high ground, John, on the analysis of the labor economy, and she owns the phrase slack. And she was courageous at a time in the great financial crisis to try to help Americans understand this new labor economy and in a different way we see it right now and I won't mince words she's been muzzled the labor market expert and yeah. we just don't get to hear from her enough Tom Keane Jonathan Farrow with Anna Edwards this morning Bramo's going to come back after the long weekend futures this morning so if you're just says. tuning in down about three quarters of one percent on the S&P on the Nasdaq 100 down one four percentage points the losses continue. Looking at the bond market, yields just about unchanged, up about a basis point, a 10-year to 320. Big moves at the front end. Looking at 350 earlier than back in a way. We'll have a look at that a little bit later. I want to talk about FX and not just sterling, but also the euro. Sterling breaking down about a half of 1% across the street now. Not just Wall Street, but across Europe. All the calls coming through for a 75 basis point hike, and yet here we are. Basically a parity on euro dollar, negative four tenths of 1%. TK, tweet of the week from Jamie Barber out on Twitter. These are very good. How Tom Keane would discuss <laughs> FX dynamics with Pharaoh in Ibiza. There we go, Tom. For those of you on radio, there's a gentleman with count of one, two, three, four larger beverages of his choice waltzing across the beach. Can we just clarify that that's Tom and not me? Because in Jackson Hole, Wyoming, we arrived to the diner. And I, I talked about this story last week, so allow me to do it again. Scene. TK and I walk in. Cowboys, literally real cowboys. Real cowboys. Sat there, yeah. having a meal. We walk in in suits, looking very New York and out of place. Tom walks in with two martinis, <laughs> two martinis with olives in, and slams them down on the table <coughs> and orders a steak well done. And I look around and think, steak well done? Who gets a steak well done, Tom? It's Wyoming. With two it's Wyoming. martinis. I would have had the, the bison, table. I would have had the bison, but it was not in that restaurant, so I had to have the steak as well. You extend the beverages of your choice out, John. That was sure. a lengthy, that right? lengthy dinner, as they uh, say. Right now, we extend out to intelligence on hydrocarbons. Amrita Sen joins us, Director of Research and Energy Aspects. This is what we do on a Thursday. Francisco Blanche coming up on the macro. <laughs> Amrita Sen on the dynamics right now. Amrita, which part of the micro matters now for weak oil? Which part are you studying? China. I would say that's the number one uh, concern in the market and uh, a big driver of sentiment, not just in oil, right, across asset classes. Uh, but if you look at our balances, you know, we have, but even here, we've been talking about, despite the weakness in European and kind of right. US demand, uh, it's, it's Asian demand that's stronger. And our expectation has been that China will be recovering. Now, that's not quite happening. What is the dollar dynamic? And I mean this in dollar pairs like dollar Philippine peso goes out to new Marcos Jr. weakness as well. And there's other selected currencies. But even away from dollar, Aussie yen shows maximum Australian strength. What does that mean for hydrocarbons in the Pacific Rim? I mean, look, that's happening because, again, Australia and, and other commodity producers are clearly benefiting from such high commodity prices. It is to be expected, and that also means that commodity importers, which is the vast majority of Asia-Pacific <coughs> countries, um, they have that added whammy, right? right, not just of high outright energy prices, but also weak uh, exchange rates, which means the import costs are higher. But having said that, outside of China, demand numbers are still very strong. If you remember, I'm sure you've seen it, the U.S. numbers for June got revised up by 700,000 barrels per day. You know, every week we've had yeah. media headlines and other like <clears throat> analysts hyperventilating about, oh, weak gasoline demand, weak gasoline demand. And we keep saying the weekly EIA numbers are honestly worth not right. very much because of the amount of revisions that go on. And John mentioning the airline travel as well there. Uh, you know, and I look at this, Aussie yen is really at a rare place back 20 years, out one and a half standard deviation strong Australia. That shows the swings that we're seeing right now. 
Mm. Yeah, well, Aussie and you're capturing the commodity story, you're capturing the interest rate differentials, aren't you there? Uh, and Rita, uh, someone's clearly celebrating in the background of your shot, so congratulations to them for whatever it is they're oh, celebrating. Oh, it's our 10-year anniversary. Nice. It was, it's literally... Lovely. It's 10 year anniversary. Well, congratulations to you. Why, yeah. Fabulous. Congratulations you. to you. I, I want to ask you about the end of December. When we get to the point where Europe is not supposed to buy any more Russian oil, how smooth can that be? It's not going to be smooth at all, uh, especially if we don't have clarity on the Iran deal. And for us, even if there is an Iran deal, uh, it, the barrels don't really hit the market till January of next year. So this is going to be a very, very tricky time because Europe, or the EU particularly, has to get rid of at least another 1.3, potentially as much as 1.7 million barrels per day of Russian oil. And that is not going to be easy to replace because you've seen what's happened this summer uh, when that volume of oil was still coming into Europe. Every single benchmark went to record highs in terms of the physical market, not necessarily the, the financial contract. Uh, imagine another 1.4 on average being having to, re we need to replace that. I'm not sure where we're going to get that oil from. Amrita, thank you. Pretty scary speaking to people in the commodity okay. market, Tom. When yes, you get into the detail that's right. Of this. Yes, Amrita yes, Sen yes. Of energy aspects. First thing she said, China. Well, let's talk about China. 20.9 million residents going to be locked down in Chengdu, Tom. Yeah. In the date is the 1st of September 2022. Tom, we're still doing this. We're still doing this in we're China. That's the latest news. And Chengdu is sort of a rocking city. When you look at the fancy magazines, John, it's away 800 miles in from Hong Kong, and it's sort of like an in city. It, you know, it's like it's like the one place there, sort of happening away from. China politics and Beijing and, and all that. And here they are locked down. Can we say, John, it's the size of New York City? Fourth the biggest city. Hey, Tom, so. bigger than that. Yeah. 20.9 million residents. Yeah. It's huge. And, uh, and you know, you, you look, here's a headline just out, chart banner. Thank you so much for this. China, August, new home sales down 31%. Microdata, Leland Miller like data. But again, it folds into what we see on the screen and comes right back to markets in America. Well, the issues in China, Tom, are clearly going to be an issue in the commodity market. And Anna, I don't think you can have a call on crude or anything in the commodity market for that matter, including copper, of course, without a call on the outlook for China. I think that's almost impossible. Yeah, absolutely. And then that has a knock-on impact to equities here in Europe that we see really clearly. So on a day like today, you see a basic resource stocks sell off. You see consumer products sell off because all those luxury companies get another fresh reminder, another another sort of slap in the face reminder of how tough things can be. In it's China. a punch yeah. in the face. For the Europeans, Tom, for mainland Europe, especially the Germans, leverage to the Chinese economy, leverage to Russian gas supply, all of that, TK, coming together in the worst yeah. possible way for that economy this year. The singular salvation away from this legitimate groom, gloom is a disinflationary trend when we see goods and even services ebb. That's the hope for September, John. Let's hope we get it, Tom, without a big hit to GDP. Live from New York, this is Bloomberg. challenges for General Dynamics and what are the biggest opportunities? So I think in, in any business, um, the challenges are solving complex problems that come to you. You know, the, the problems that come to me and my senior leadership team for, for resolving 
tend to be highly complex and meddlesome. So your ability to solve those complex problems are an important element, I think, of the value that we add um, to the company. And then I think opportunities, you, know, you always want to make sure that you've got a creative enough mind, an open enough mind to be able to see around square corners. What am I missing? You know, the why questions are really powerful. Why are we not doing this or why are we doing this? I ask those questions a lot and in the answers, you can sometimes tease out some real opportunities, some hidden things. But thinking creatively about opportunities and problems is really important. And what about the industry generally? Do you think they have big challenges now as the defense budget probably comes down a bit? So I think that um, we are all uh, responsible and, and we have an obligation uh, to find the latest and best technologies that we can for our customers and deliver them in the most cost-effective manner we can. And I think that that's a challenge and an opportunity for all of the big defense companies. covers the world like Bloomberg. We have to get interest rates higher and bring inflation back to our targets. Spare capacity is becoming scarce. We are running on thin ice. No one deliberately wants to go into battle, but we sleepwalk into conflict. With unmatched reach and resources from more than 120 countries, the moment news breaks, 24 hours a day, Bloomberg, your global business authority. Markets come down in Europe from the financial centers of the world. Bloomberg Markets European Close with Guy Johnson in London and Alex Steele in New York. Real-time numbers, real-time analysis, weekdays. that they've already done, we haven't felt the full impact of them yet. There's a lot of tightening in the pipeline. We really should be focusing on the objective of the Fed, which is to get growth down, get inflation down. And of course, the interest rate hikes are just a means to an end. Now we're at a point where uh, do we go back to the don't fight the Fed mantra? There are different stories of what is happening to people when you think about the economy. There is a, at least mild recession coming in. 